All right, yeah, thanks for the nice introduction, Dirk, uh, and thanks for letting me speak in the Advanced Applied Econometrics course. So the title is Causal Inference in Machine Learning and AI. I guess the subtitle would be And Lessons for Econometrics. Um, so I will talk about this topic, new emerging topic in, in the realm of AI, but then also what we can take away from that uh, for econometrics in our own research uh, as econometricians. You already mentioned it. I just want to briefly show it to you. Uh, the talk uh, today is based on a paper that I've written together with Elias Baron Inboim uh, from the Computer Science Department at Columbia. Uh, so he is the expert in the, in the AI field. And uh, yeah, that is available on archive. You can just download it. Uh, the link is in the slides, but uh, I guess we will also put it up online, the paper. Um, so uh, later on, you can. You can double check what we talked about. It will be a bit of a, I apologize in advance, it will be a bit of a tour de force uh, through this because uh, yeah, there's lots to say about this topic, but uh, I hope to keep it as intuitive as possible so that you can take away the main issues. Okay, let me go into full screen mode once more. Okay, so why causal inference? Um, I guess we all sort of know that causal inference is an important topic in econometrics. Uh, it has been so since the beginning of the discipline. Uh, I have here the, the quote by, or the, the reference by Frisch in uh, 1933, is uh, the first editorial actually of Econometrica. So basically the, the founding date of, of the econometrics discipline and already there it was said that why do we do econometrics? Uh, it's because we want to inform policymakers, legislators, um, or managers, if, if you're more in the business field, um, by using quantitative data and statistical techniques. Um, and often that uh, entails to do causal inference because we want to know the causal effect of, for example, some policy or, or management initiatives on some outcome that we care about. Um, so, Causal inference has always been important in econometrics ever since. Um, there was a little bit of a decline, let's say in the 70s and 80s, when people got a bit, um, not annoyed by causal inference, but a bit skeptical. Uh, but definitely since the, the beginning of the 90s, um, you know all these papers by Karlin Kruger, um, Guido Imbens, Angrist, and all these big names in econometrics. Causal inference is definitely um, on the agenda again, uh, and very important. And interestingly, in the computer science field, um, there has been sort of a parallel development um, since the late 1980s. People started in, in machine learning, but also artificial intelligence, they started to care about causal inference. Um, and I will explain in a bit uh, why they started to care about causal inference. Um, but the interesting part for me was always that this seems to be sort of a, a parallel stream of literature in the computer science field um, that we economists are not so aware of. Um, the computer science people, they are probably more aware with what the econ people are doing, but there has never been really a fruitful exchange, let's say, of, of ideas. Uh, and that is the aim of, of this talk and also the paper that we've written to sort of present what was going on since the late 80s, early 90s in the computer science field and what we can hopefully take away from that literature for our own research and our own um, econometric practice. Um, so yeah, that's the goal of the talk, uh, sort of give uh, a rough review of, uh, of development in that literature uh, and that's why I already said it's going to be a bit of a tour de force because uh, there are many topics to explore. Uh, into some, I try to get a little bit more deeper so that you get a good understanding of the, of the workings. Over some, I will just browse or brush over, um, but, but we'll see. And please always stop me, of course, if there are any questions on the way. Um, and yeah, hopefully then uh, after getting a bit more in touch with these techniques that we can in the future also foster mutual knowledge exchange between the two communities uh, and benefit from, from sort of combined uh, knowledge production. All right, so why causal inference in the, in the AI field? Um, 
causality is actually a pretty tough problem for an artificial intelligence or, or robot, if you will. Um, because causality is, is a concept that we as humans seem to sort of have a very intuitive grasp of. Um, we all know since we're little that if we touch the, the hot stove, uh, that's going to hurt. Or if we switch on the light, right? If we, if we switch the switch, uh, the light will turn on. And that is a causal relationship or, or causal knowledge that we acquire early on. Um, but if we think about deeper about this problem or, or what causality actually is, we realize pretty soon that um, this intuitive understanding is a bit misleading and that we actually don't have a really good grasp what, what causality uh, actually means. Uh, and you can check, uh, I, I will not get into this here, but you can check the extant philosophical literature on this topic. There has been books and books and books written uh, about causality in philosophy, starting with probably David Hume uh, and the treatise on, on human nature, which was what, sort of the first um, in, the, in the modern area, let's, at least. Uh, Aristotle has also written about this. Um, and there's still no consensus. Um, and that's a bit of a problem uh, because you all probably know this this Einstein quote uh, who said, if you can't teach a thing to a six-year-old, you haven't grasped it yourself uh, that well. Uh, and the same goes here in the field of AI. If you can't teach a concept to a robot, you probably haven't grasped it yourself very well. Uh, and that's exactly what's going on with, uh, uh, with causality, that uh, we have this intuitive understanding, but uh, we didn't really quite grasp it what it is. Uh, we had troubles, for example, formulating it in a mathematical way, and that also prohibited us from, from teaching it to an artificial intelligence. Um, yeah. So the, the AI boom that we've seen since uh, 2012, so the, the deep learning boom in machine learning and AI, uh, that is something that is purely based on, on correlational relationships in the data, right? So these uh, machine learning techniques and algorithms that people use uh, and that were very successful in, you know, recommending you all the great shows on Netflix or beating the guy in, in Go, right? The AlphaGo example that you can watch the documentary about, that is all based on, on correlations. So there's uh, lots, of, lots of data that these algorithms would work with, uh, big data algorithms. And they uh, are very good at seeing patterns in the data. Sometimes we also call this data mining uh, of correlations between one variable and the other. Um, and uh, that you could see as sort of um, a lever or, or a door that opens to the realm of causality. Because if you observe correlations between variables, um, you might suspect that there's actually an underlying causal relationship uh, underneath uh, this correlation. Uh, and that is something that has been discussed again since the days of, of Hume. Uh, the philosophers call this a constant conjunction. So if you always see two events correlated, right? I touch the hot stove and a second later I feel pain in my finger. If I constantly observe this as a stable pattern of nature, I might suspect that there's an underlying causal relationship uh, behind this relationship. But if that's the case, and if that is what machine learning algorithms are doing and what an AI is currently capable of doing, then I raise you the following question. Okay, how can we prevent a future robot that we're trying to build uh, from trying to make the rooster crow at 3 a.m. in order to make the sun come up? Because if we're thinking about this constant conjunction uh, worldview, this is also a stable pattern that we can observe in reality, a stable correlation between the crow at the rooster and the sun coming up, right? So a future robot might collect lots and lots of data, many roosters around the world uh, at many different points in time and always observes these two events going in conjunction. First the rooster crows, afterwards the sun comes up. If we now equate the two, this correlation with causality, the robot might come to the, uh, to the idea that, okay, 
now it's not 6 a.m., it's 3 a.m., but I want the sun to appear for whatever reason. Maybe it's good for, for my internal algorithm uh, because I need the sun to grow some plants or whatever. And uh, I, I want the sun to appear, so I make the rooster crow. That, that is an idea that a robot could come to. And then we have a situation like this, right? Our future AI overlords um, are strangling the poor roosters on the fields because they want the sun to appear. That's of course something that we don't want uh, because for us, again, this intuitive notion, it's immediately understandable that this uh, approach won't work. So uh, we want to tame the robots and want to rather have something like this, uh, a more nicely behaved robot that uh, realizes that uh, being violent to the poor chicken doesn't uh, doesn't do anything that he or she wants, um, but uh, we there's basically no way of of making the sun appear at least not with our current means. Okay, here I have a quote uh, that is related to that. Uh, it's from Judea Pearl, who is the Turing Award winner in computer science. The Turing Award is um, similar to the Nobel Prize in economics, probably. Uh, so very high uh, recognition. And uh, he said once in a, in a publication, to build truly intelligent machines, we need to teach them cause and effect. And it's exactly because causality, this notion of causality is a fundamental concept in human thinking. So we think in that way for us, it's intuitively very easy to grasp, at least after a certain age. Um, so if we want to have meaningful interactions with a robot or an artificial intelligence, we uh, need to teach them the same concept. And at the moment, we're, we're probably just at the beginning of doing this uh, because as I said, most of the current machine learning and AI techniques are purely prediction-based or correlation-based. There was even a book uh, by, by three economists, um, Agravel, Joshua Gans, and um, I forgot the third author now, excuse me, <laughs> uh, at the moment which was called Prediction Machines, uh, discussing all the uh, developments currently that are going on in machine learning and AI and how they can be useful for economics. Um, but as the title already suggests, that was purely based on machine learning algorithms that are prediction-based. Um, so in other words, and that relates to, to the title of the slides, Beyond Curve Fitting, machine learning tools as we have them currently are very sophisticated so don't get me wrong they have been very successful in in many applications so they are very uh, sophisticated high dimensional curve fitting tools right because the correlation between variables is always you can um, draw this in a scatter plot right variable x and variable y in a scatter plot and then you can draw a curve through them either a linear uh, regression or polynomial regression or non-parametric regression but that's all that it is it's just estimating in a in a very efficient way for lots and lots of data points uh, a relationship between two or more variables um, but nothing in this in the theoretical basis of current machine learning tools allows to capture this uh, this notion of causality and the important thing of causality is uh, that causal relationships are always something asymmetric, right? So um, we, we think that the sun actually makes the rooster crow and not the other way around, okay? So the sun coming up uh, and the first uh, yeah, rays of light in the morning wake the rooster up and make him crow, but it's not the other way around. And this is this as asymmetry. Okay, if X causes Y, we think that Y causes X cannot be true at the same time. Um, yeah, and if we want machines to, as I said, meaningful interact with us, we need to sort of uh, teach them this notion uh, what they currently don't have yet. Okay, so that's the AI side, uh, maybe a little bit uh, science fiction for, for some of you, but I want to show you why this also matters in research and uh, why this, for example, also matters in the tech world. So uh, I have here an example for you. Um, it's, that was coined the, the Google controversy and it was like a year ago in March, 2019. 
um, a very interesting case. So Google has long been uh, sort of accused, or there has been a long uh, standing accusation towards Google that they are underpaying women in the organization. All right, so there were many newspaper articles on this um, for, for many years, always popping up uh, with this accusation. And Google took this actually very seriously uh, and they investigated this. And as you know, Google has probably uh, some of the best data science teams in the world. So they have many smart data scientists uh, in their organization. And they investigated this, uh, this problem. And what they came up was actually something very surprising. Uh, so here I have a quote from the New York Times, March 2019, saying that when Google conducted a study recently to determine whether the company, so I don't see the word here, but the company is underpaying women and members of minority groups, that was the second accusation, so women and minorities, it found the um, to the surprise of just about everyone that men were paid less money than women for doing similar work. Okay, so uh, completely the opposite. They have been accused to underpay women and minorities. And what they found, the smart data scientists at Google, was that it's actually exactly the opposite. Um, and how did they come to this conclusion? Uh, they uh, mainly looked at um, males and females uh, within the same sort of hierarchy level, right? So either you know, management positions or non-management positions. Um, uh, executive positions versus non-executive positions. So they looked within each occupation um, and uh, compared men and women doing similar types of work. And when they did this, they actually found the surprising result that uh, if, you, if you only look within the same occupation, that, that men earn less. And from this study, so this, this was actually also pretty relevant for policy. From this study, they concluded, okay, we have to do something about this. We don't want to discriminate people in our organization. And what they did, they actually raised the salaries for men uh, instead of women. Uh, so there was an immediate uh, management initiative or policy uh, coming out of this finding. Okay, but what's going on here? It's, a, it's sort of a paradox. Right, um, so, so we're thinking uh, that women and, and minorities are underpaid, then they conduct a study and they found exactly the opposite. Uh, and I will tell you in the next couple of slides, I show you a stylized example, uh, how this can happen and how this is probably um, a fault of interpreting correlational findings wrongly in a causal way. Okay. So uh, let me jump to this slide. Um, as I said, stylized example uh, uh, motivated by, by the actual findings. So these are just purely made up numbers just to, to show you what's going on. Suppose we collected data on, on wages of 100 women and 100 men in our company X. All right, so that's the study we're trying to do. Uh, and we observe the following distribution of average monthly, monthly salaries for women and men. And here I distinguish to, to make it very simple just between two possible occupations. Uh, one is a management position where you're sort of a team leader and you supervise uh, other people in the organization. So that's, uh, that's a management position. And a non-management position would be you are a highly paid data scientist at Google, but you don't supervise other people, for example. Okay, and uh, so you have men and women, male and female, and non-management and management, and we can um, depict this distribution of data that we collect here in this simple two by two matrix. Okay, and uh, let's suppose this is what we found. So we have here women uh, in the first column, and in the first row, non-management positions. So these are women that are working in a non-management position, we find an average monthly salary of $3,163. And we find here in parentheses, that's the case number. So 87 women work in non-management positions versus 13 women in management positions and they earn much more, $5,592 on average. The same we do for, for male employees, 
3,015 in non-management position and 5,319 in the management position. And again, we have the case numbers here. All right, so um, stylized example, but uh, imagine uh, this was sort of a huge data collection effort throughout the whole organization. Right, so we scraped the whole HR data, had to uh, combine many databases until we came up with this simple two by two matrix, but that's the outcome. Okay, so that's the data that we collected. And now it's a question, how do we interpret this one? Right? How do we assess whether women are actually underpaid in our organization um, with respect to, to men or male employees? And we, we have two ways of doing this here, right? So the first way could be to take uh, uh, just a simple average here. So we take all these four numbers, multiply it by the, by the case numbers and divide it by the total number of cases and take a simple average. And uh, this is what I've done here, right? Um, so, and of course we want to know the difference between women and men. So we first compute the average for women 87 women in a non-management position over 100 because that's the total number of women in our sample times 3163 plus the women in the management position 13 over 100 times 5592 okay that's the average salary for women and then we subtract the average salary for men the same here again 59 in a non-management position 41 in a management position times the respective average monthly salaries. And when we do this exercise here, we get a negative difference of $481. So according to that analysis, the, the simple average first for women, then for men, and we subtract them would lead to a, to a negative difference. And um, yeah, the conclusion here would be that women would be underpaid according to that data that we found. But if we look at the data again here, this negative difference is, is, seems to be a bit surprising because now if we look at you know, this notion of um, same pay for same work, so we look at uh, men and women within the same job categories, within non-management and management positions, we see that in every category here, women are actually paid more. So 3,163 is larger than 3,015. And in the management um, category, the same women are paid 5,592, almost 5,600 is larger than 5,300. So how can we then get a negative overall difference, right? That seems to be a bit surprising. And that's exactly what, what the Google data scientists have done, right? So uh, either from a notion, as I said, this, uh, okay, we want to compare men and women within the same job category because we think, you know, equal pay for equal work or simply, um, yeah, because they, they had an intuitive understanding for that. Uh, so they didn't only look at the simple average, but they looked within each stratum of, of job category, right? So we, like we did before, we first compute the difference within each job position. So in the first non-management position, that will be $148 difference. And within the management category, it's 272. And then we multiply these two differences with, uh, again, the case numbers, right? For non-management position, we have 87, women, 59 men divided by 200, that's the total number of observations in our sample, times 148. And then for management, the same 13 plus 41 over 200 times 272. And we get roughly a difference of $181.74. Okay, but now it's a question, we have two competing answers, which one is the correct one? Right, so uh, the first version is what we would call the unadjusted average, right? We just averaged over all men, women, took the difference. The second version is we first condition on job position, look within each stratum, compute the difference, and only then average afterwards.
Okay, and both of these averages give us uh, completely different results, right? According to the first version, we would say women are underpaid, raise the salary for females in the organization. The second version, uh, the Google case is, oh no, actually uh, women are paid more than men, so we should raise the salaries for, for men, okay? Maybe you've already seen the title of the slide. Um, this is what statisticians know actually already since, since ages. It even has a name. Uh, this paradox is called Simpson's paradox. And Simpson's paradox is a situation where um, a, a simple relationship, right? Like the effect of female versus male on salaries, uh, the sign of that relationship can completely flip once we look at adjusted numbers, right? Adjusted here for management position. So um, overall, we find a negative difference, but if we adjust for job positions, we suddenly find exactly the opposite sign. Um, so this, the, the sign of the effect flips. And um, we've seen that in, in many different examples throughout statistics history, right? This Simpsons paradox popping up, and it's always sort of a head scratcher. Like, what is going on? How can that be? Okay, so I would argue that in the gender pay gap example, right, the correct answer, let me go back maybe one slide, is actually the first one here. That uh, it makes intuitively more sense that um, we actually here have a negative difference and that women in the organization are underpaid. Uh, usually, when I give this lecture in in sort of a classroom, I, I have now a little poll and uh, ask people like, what do you think? What is the right answer? And then often it's sort of 50-50 uh, divided, um, but okay, we can't do this now, unfortunately. But just ask yourself, what is the, what would, is more, yeah. Um, what makes more sense to you, which answer? But I would answer, uh, yeah, I would say it's the, the first version that the negative difference makes more sense. And I will explain you in a minute uh, why this is the case. But let's assume, okay, we, we have the negative difference here and, and that makes intuitive sense. Now I'll raise you a second example, okay? Now um, I have this, this data collected here. And what you see here is actually exactly the same data. So I have nothing changed with the numbers here. They're still the same, average monthly salaries are the same. Also the case numbers are the same. And also non-management and management, right? So that's all still the same as before. I've just ex uh, exchanged the labels over here. Instead of women, we now have a healthy lifestyle and men unhealthy lifestyle. So the idea is here, let's assume we did the same data collection for a different research question. We now don't want to know what is the difference between men and women uh, in terms of salaries, but we want to know who is paid more people that have a healthy lifestyle or unhealthy lifestyle. Okay. And since the numbers are the same in this example, right, we would again find the same, um, the same averages that we computed before. Right? So if you take the unadjusted average, we would find that people with a healthy lifestyle actually earn less, right? Minus $481. If we take the adjusted average, um, looking at each position here, job position, we would find a positive difference that people with a, um, with a healthy lifestyle are actually paid more. And again, you can ask yourself the question, what is now more intuitive to you? What makes more sense as sort of an outcome? Um, and I run the same poll usually again, uh, and then it's even more divided. And usually the classroom switches a bit uh, because in this example, it's the majority is often in favor of that it makes more intuitive sense that people with a healthy lifestyle are paid more than an unhealthy lifestyle. Maybe they can work longer hours or they are less, you know, less on sick leave and that is better for their promotion probabilities and so on, right? Okay, but um, let's assume you, you share my intuition here. That is even more paradoxical, right? So we have two times the same, exactly the same distribution of the data, 
remember I have nothing changed, nothing has changed here with these numbers. I've just exchanged the labels and the research question changed. And uh, in the first version, it was more plausible that you had a negative difference. In the second one, the, uh, the positive difference uh, was more plausible, although nothing from, uh, from the side of the statistics has changed. And that's exactly the, the problem that also, again, our robot would face. If the robot only knows, you know, can only look at large chunks of data, big data, analyze them purely correlational based, the, what we call as statisticians or econometricians, the joint distribution of the data in both cases is exactly the same, right? So the robot ha would have no way of distinguishing the two. What we do as humans, when I ask you, what do you find more plausible? We sort of have an intuition and the intuition is often based on causal knowledge. Uh, we, uh, we have implicit causal knowledge that, uh, you know, females are often underpaid in the job market, all the publications about the gender pay gap. While from an intuitive standpoint, it makes more sense to us probably that people with a healthy lifestyle have, um, have higher salaries than with an unhealthy lifestyle. But that's sort of extra knowledge that the robot doesn't have that we bring to the table in order to judge what is more plausible in both situations. Okay, how can we formalize this sort of causal intuition, right? Um, and that will be the, um, the goal of this lecture, um, what I will tell you in the following. Here in this, in both situations or in both examples, it makes sense to capture the first example in that way here, okay? So if you share my intuition, then probably it makes sense to think about gender having an effect on salary, right? That is denoted here by this arrow. So the arrow captures the causal effect of gender on salary. And what is going on with the management position? We probably believe that gender has an effect on management in this direction here. So the causal direction goes from gender to management in the way that, you know, females often have, um, yeah, um, often have lower promotion probabilities, right? They uh, end up less often in, in management positions and that's capturing this, uh, this diagram here. So there's a direct effect of gender on salary and there's also an indirect effect going via management because females are promoted less frequently and that will also have an effect on salary. In the second example, it is probably plausible and again, you can debate this, it's just a stylized example, but if you share my intuition, then it makes sense to think about this in the way that now lifestyle has an effect on salary. This is what we want to measure, of course, but now lifestyle doesn't affect so much whether I end up in a management position or not, it's probably the other way around. Right? And again, we can, we can debate this and discuss this, but uh, let's assume this is the case, that people who are in a management position, that also affects their lifestyle because they have to lo work longer hours, um, cannot go to the gym as often, uh, do not sleep that well, and that affects their lifestyle. And uh, if you have these two situations, right? The left and the right situation. The only difference between the two is the causal direction here is changed, right? First it was gender affecting management and in the second example, management affected lifestyle. So the error flipped here, the direction of the error. And that makes a huge difference in the way we need to analyze the data. Because in the first example here, you should, then not do what Google did. You should not take the adjusted average and um, adjust or control for management. You should just look at the plain unadjusted average and find the negative $481 or so what it was uh, in this situation here. And we will get into that. Why is this case? Why you should not adjust for management in this uh, example here? In the second case though, if the causal structure is like this and the arrow is flipped, then it's exactly what you want to do. Then you want to adjust for management because management is sort of this confounding variable that um, creates a bias in your estimates and you want control for that. 
So the takeaway message here is the, the simple direction of the arrow here. Otherwise, everything is the same. The data is the same. The, the research question is, at least in, in style, it's the same. But just this one direction of the arrow here that flips makes a huge difference for the way we need to analyze the problem. Right? And you've seen with the New York Times article that this has uh, important practical implications uh, because depending on what uh, result you get from your analysis, you have to do it right in order to implement the right policy. And probably, I mean, yeah, that's, it's not set in stone. We can always just sort of um, discuss these, these examples in light of the theory that we're having. But probably what Google did was taking the wrong conclusion in, in raising the salary for men although they should have just looked at the plain unadjusted average and then they find um, a negative difference. Okay, so this is the, the Google pay gap uh, example. I think it um, illustrates nicely how important these sort of uh, background assumptions that we put on a problem because uh, just again to reiterate and go back, the data itself is not able to tell us what's going on. The data was in both cases the same, but the background knowledge that we put on a problem, so our causal intuition, causal assumptions, makes a huge difference in the way we need to analyze the problem um, and can have dramatic uh, implications for, for policy and management. Okay, so this is basically summarized here what I just said, so I can brush over this. And uh, in the following now, so you already see here the, the graphs, they will come up uh, quite a bit uh, in the following. Um, and we will formalize this notion of what it means to have these arrows and, uh, and these little notes here. But uh, the, the goal of the, of the lecture and the following is really to give you a more formalized set of tools uh, in order to capture this intuition and to not run into the same problem as, uh, as Google did. Okay, so give me a second. Maybe it's actually a good time to, um, to take questions. Are there any questions? I don't see the chat, to be honest. There should be a button. So I see the button at the bottom of my screen. Um, but you, you might see it at the top now because you are sharing your screen and it's different. Yes, I, I see, uh, see something orange. Um, yeah, so. Okay, Lily said all clear here. Uh, now is the time. Okay, uh, does the does Google do the Google people realize uh, that issue, or, or have they uh, have they realized that? Um, I don't know to be honest. I mean, I uh, uh, I recognize this um, uh, on the internet and was sort of a lively debate among economists because um, this, if you're a labor economist, this is something that you learn probably in your first uh, year in grad school or as in your master's degree that um, conditioning on, on occupation levels is usually tricky from a causal inference perspective. Uh, you can do it, but uh, it, it buys you in all sorts of problems. Um, so I don't know whether that uh, reached Google as well and whether they have changed something since then. Um, would be interesting to know, yeah. I don't know. Any more questions? Okay, as far as I remember, the issue female salaries were also higher on average because salaries in Google are largely based on your productivity. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, so I only gave you uh, a gist of the problem here. We will get back later into uh, when we, uh, yeah, when we've introduced the notion of a, a collider. Um, and then we'll talk a bit more about this, why, why this can actually happen, this Simpsons paradox. And it's related to unobserved productivity. That's right, Marina. So you're exactly on the right track. Okay, so then uh, let's carry on. And if there are more questions, we can uh, stop later still. Okay, so, so far we have causal intuition and causal knowledge. How can we formalize this? 
All right. And uh, what is uh, very handy for that um, and, and a very um, useful tool in that realm are structural causal models. Um, so let's look here at a simple example of three variables. So we have Z, X, and Y. So these are the three variables that we care about. You can think about this as gender, occupation, and salaries, right? And uh, we now put uh, a structure on this problem. So we formalize our intuitions about the causal relationships uh, behind these variables. Uh, economists would also call this a data generating process. So the data that we observe, how is this data um, yeah, coming about in reality? How does reality or nature assign values to these variables? I will mute you again, by the way, Dirk. Yeah, now it's better, no background noise. Okay, um, so let's look for example here at the second row. Um, which says that x is a function of two other variables, z and ux. And z is here in this model a so-called endogenous variable. Um, probably you've heard that term already before. Because z is, is another variable in this model that we care about. Right? So z is, uh, uh, is itself a function of another variable u. And then we have a third variable y, which is a function of x, z, and u, y. Okay, so I've called z an endogenous variable because z is determined inside of the model. Right? So z here stands on the left. And these u's that you see here on the right are so-called exogenous uh, background factors. Um, so these are all influence factors that, that are happening outside in the world but that we not further explain in the model. So we abstract away from them and uh, we also don't measure them. So these are sort of unobserved variables. Uh, and if you have ever seen a sort of regression equation, this is exactly the error term in the regression equation, right? Sometimes it's noted by an epsilon. Here I call it a U to make uh, clear that it's sort of unobserved variables that create variation in a variable, right, Z, but we don't explain this variation. Um, and uh, so the causal structure is here in the sense that, okay, Z is just determined by background factors, U, Z, X is determined by a background factor, U, X, and this endogenous variable, Z, and Y has two endogenous influence factors. Okay, um, so I already said it's, it's very similar to a regression equation, but there are a couple of important differences here. First of all, we don't actually have equations, but we have this, uh, this little arrow here. And this is what we call an assignment operator. If you've ever worked with, um, with software like R, for example, I think uh, the same works in Python as well. You, you know these uh, assignment operators from the computer science um, or programming languages. And uh, this is just to denote that, uh, as I said earlier, causal relationships are always something asymmetric. So if we have here the relationship that Z causes X, right? It's not true at the same time that X causes Z. But if we denote this with an equation, right? Uh, an equation is, uh, is symmetric, right? So if we have, for example, a simple equation like X is equal to A times Z, then you can of course divide here by, um, by A, Right? And you could have the same statement that uh, Z is an equation of X divided by A. Right? So you could just divide by A and flip the sign and there's nothing to prevent you from that in the formalism in an equation. Usually in the regression equation, we make this again implicitly sure by writing always the, um, the effect variable, right? Y on the left-hand side and the cause on the right-hand side and we never switch them around. But in order to make this uh, much clearer here, we use the assignment operator uh, instead of the equations. Because with the assignment operator, it's immediately clear that if Z causes X, the other way around cannot be true, capturing the asymmetry. The second thing is we don't have linear equations and usually in a regression, uh, you have sort of a, a linear um, relationship 
a plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x two and so on plus epsilon in the end, right? That is a linear relationship, uh, just pluses and minuses and, and linear uh, parameters. But here we want to keep this much more general and we uh, look at these structural causal models in, in any possible shape or form, right? So these Fs, these functions underlying can be anything. They can be quadratic, cubic, uh, cubic uh, functions are very popular these days in the US, I've heard, and uh, could be could be also whatever trigonomic functions, anything. Okay, so we don't make a specific assumptions about how these functions look like, and that is much more flexible than just linear relationships. Okay, these are the two differences, but otherwise um, these structural causal models are very similar to what we already worked in econometrics since again the 1940s and 50s right so the uh, the cowles foundations for people that uh, have heard uh, about them right in the 50s were very big in pushing econometrics and exactly this sort of structural econometrics and uh, behind all this ai literature the underlying basis the structural causal models are actually exactly the same uh, exactly the same so we sort of come from the same basis Right? And that's also why it's interesting to, to sort of make the connections because the basis is the same in econometrics and in the causal AI literature, just developed in very different directions uh, and it would be interesting to, to uh, converge the paths in them. Okay, so this is the structural causal model here on the left-hand side. And uh, you can also capture this structural causal model. I will put here away for a second. Um, you can also denote that in a graphical way, and we've already seen that uh, before in the in the gender pay gap example, uh, because here, again, looking at the x, x has one uh, determinant z, and we can denote this here by the arrow from z to x. So z causes x, and we draw an arrow. Um, pointing into x and variables in the model we denote by these nodes here. And uh, this is a simple um, network, right? A network uh, contains usually nodes and edges connecting them. And uh, yeah, a network is equivalent to talk about uh, a graph in, in a mathematical space. So this here is, uh, would be in the um, mathematical notion would be a graph. Okay, so z causes x, we see that here. x causes y, we see that here in the third equation, and z also causes y, which is captured here, right? So exactly the same notion here, captured in the in a, um, in equation form, is here in the graphical form. There's one added thing here, in which is this um, bidirected arrow here. So we have an arrow pointing into Z and an arrow pointing into Y, and the two are connected, and it's this dashed edge here. This is capturing the notion that uh, the background factors between Z and Y, or the error terms, if you want to call it like this, are correlated. So U and uh, UZ and UY would be denoted as correlated in this example. And how does this correlation come about? Uh, it's usually sort of a third variable um, that we don't observe in the model, that we don't measure, but that is affecting both z and y at the same time, and that creates this error correlation. A graph like that, just to have some notation, we call also a semi-Markovian model. Um, because yeah, the, whenever we have these dashed arrows here capturing an uh, error correlation, that is a, a semi-Markovian model. I will not explain uh, where the name comes from, but just to have this notation straight. All right, um, and if we capture the causal model that we put out uh, in this way here, it's immediately clear that uh, you know we don't make any functional form assumptions here. Because we're just saying that z causes x in a qualitative way, but we're not uh, making any assumptions about how this causal relationship uh, looks like, right? 
So we kept these Fs here totally implicit and working with the graph um, is doing exactly that. We're not saying this is a linear relationship or this is a quadratic polynomial uh, whatever relationship. We are uh, remaining totally agnostic about um, the, yeah, the quantitative nature of this relationship, the functional form assumptions behind, um, and, and we only look purely at the qualitative relationship. So uh, whether Z causes X, but not in what way. The second thing is that we don't make any assumptions about is the correlation, uh, sorry, the distribution of these background factors. Right? So in a regression setting, we often, at least in the, in the standard, classical standard errors, right, we assume the background factors to be normally distributed. Or if you work with discrete choice models, like you've seen, like the probit or the logit, right, it will be a, an, again a normal distribution or a, uh, and a uh, type two extreme value distribution in the ordered probit would be again normal distribution, right? So often in econometrics, we make assumptions about distribution of these error terms, which help us to, to solve these models. Here in the causal AI literature, we, we stay away from that, okay? Because we're saying we want to apply these methods in as many different circumstances and environments as possible, right? So the robot should be independently working in, you know, on the Mars as well as in the, in the kindergarten group. Um, and so we, we want to stay as agnostic as possible, right? So only purely working with the qualitative relationships between variables uh, in the model. And I can already say, um, in terms of econometrics, this uh, will be very useful later on also in our research because um, in many settings we might have good information about, you know, how these relationships look like, whether linear functions are appropriate or polynomials are appropriate, but in many circumstances we also don't, right? So um, many fields are working sort of on purely on a qualitative basis. We're interested in does Z cause X? but we don't really want to make assumptions about you know, the exact functional form behind this relationship. The same for the, the error distribution, right? It's actually a good way in order to, uh, to stay as agnostic as possible and make as little assumptions as, as possible. So this uh, graphical notion here uh, actually makes a lot of sense. It captures the, the qualitative relationships that we care about, but uh, with as li little assumptions as um, as necessary. Okay, um, if we have such a graph, right, so I already told you what, what a graph is mathematically, a graph is just a collection of nodes like X, Y, and Z and connections between them, right? So, um, yeah, so that's a graph mathematically. And uh, what we have here on the right is a so-called or a special version of a graph. It's a directed acyclic graph um, because there are two things here, right? First of all, these connections between var the variables, they, are, they have a direction, exactly the causal direction. Z causes X and not the other way around. So that's the directed part. The second part is the, the acyclic part. Uh, and we have to uh, talk about this in, uh, uh, on the next slide. So acyclic means that whenever we start uh, at a certain node in the graph or in the network, let's like the node A here, acyclicity means that we can never again reach the same node. Okay, so we rule out the situations like this if we follow the direction of the arrows, A causes B, B causes C, and C causes A. That is something that uh, we want to prevent because what would this mean? Uh, this would mean that A is actually a cause of itself, right? And again, this asymmetric notion, um, if A causes B, B doesn't cause A, that's very similar here. A should not be a cause of itself. Otherwise, we have the Münchhausen story, right, that you've heard about that the guy lifted himself out of the mud, you know, from his own, uh, from his own hair. Uh, and, and that's physically impossible, right? So A uh, should not be a cause of itself. Um, that doesn't mean here for, for people that are, for example, into time series econometrics or thinking about dynamic relationships, this, um, this doesn't mean that A in the past cannot cause A in the future, 
right? Like something like um, probably Dirk has talked about uh, the innovation behavior of firms a lot in this uh, in this course. And something like, if I've been successful in the past with innovating as a firm, that will also via a mediation chain B, C, and A again cause my innovativeness in the future. That is totally possible, but then we would see these two A's as two different variables. Okay, we would put time subscription. That would mean that A T minus one can be a cause of A T plus one, no problem, but not in an instantaneous sense, right? So not at the, in an, in, uh, instantly that A is a cause of itself. That's what we want to rule out. Uh, for those of you who, um, who want to get a little bit more into this, I will not comment on this, uh, but um, I have here some, some appendix slides talking about this dynamic um, structure of problems in a time series settings, for example. Um, but think about this here as really like a cross-section uh, setting, right? So at, at one point in time. Okay, so what this means is that we rule out feedback loops, right? So A cannot be feeding back into itself. And that's the property of, of acyclicity uh, because otherwise A could be a cause of itself. And this is what we call in, in econometrics a recursive model, right? So, um, and that's what the, what the slide here is about in the appendix, recursive versus interdependent systems because sometimes in econometrics, we also um, work with interdependent systems. Um, but the, yeah, as I argue in the, in the paper, but also in the appendix, this is usually a shortcut, um, a shortcut description of an underlying more elaborate recursive model. But I want, don't want to get into that too much because it's sort of a, um, yeah, a detailed or more detailed discussion. There are extensions of this structural causal modeling framework also for cyclic graphs, where exactly when we have these cycles A feeding back into itself, um, but we don't look at these extensions here and work with the, with the acyclic notions. Uh, I also have another appendix slide here relating that to the potential outcomes framework. If you've uh, talk, uh, heard about that in the treatments effects lecture, um, what I think Dirk has introduced that last week, right, the matching estimators and so on, um, the potential outcomes framework by itself is, is usually, if you don't extend it, is also exactly acyclic. So we're in this exact same world. Okay, why are, and let me check the time. Okay, I will uh, carry on maybe 10 minutes more and then we can have a, can we have a break? Um, so why are the, these graphs, the, these directed acyclic graphs so useful for us as econometricians and the people that care about causal inference? It's because these graphs establish a connection between the theory side of it, right? So our underlying causal assumptions that we put on a problem and the statistics side, the measurement side. Uh, and this connection um, is, uh, is mainly based on, on what is called deseparation, and I want to explain here. So uh, here I took just the three simplest uh, configurations that we can have. So let's assume we have three variables uh, in, in our model, um, A, B, and C. And uh, yeah, the, the simplest possible relationships between these variables is we can either have a fork, uh, sorry, a chain, where A is causing B and B is causing C, right? Or the other way around, but that's a chain. So we have here a, a causal chain so that A is causing C via the mediator B here. Or we have a fork where B causes both A and C, right? So B, the fork going, going like this or, or upwards, uh, B is a, is a common parent um, affecting both A and C. And the third uh, configuration that we can have is a collider where A and C are both causing B and the name collider comes from the fact that these two arrows are colliding in A, right? So the causal directions are colliding in, in B. I think I said it wrongly. So B is the collider because A and C affect. Okay, so that, these are the three um, atomic configurations that we can have. And how does this relate to correlations and statistical dependencies between these variables? 
In the first case, you can probably already recognize that if A is a cause of B and B of C, then A and C will also be related, right? Because A is a distant cause of C affecting C via B. So that means that in general, if that is the case, if that is the data generating process, then A and C will be correlated in, in our data, right? So we, we collect lots of data, 200 observations again, make a survey, and we would find if, if there's an underlying causal chain, A and C are correlated. This is denoted here by this, um, this notation here. Um, this sign here means that uh, two variables are, um, are unrelated or um, independent of each other, right? So two random variables are independent of each other, but here um, A and C are actually dependent because A causes C. There's this, I see a mistake on the slides. This should be a C actually. Um, so I will send an updated version of the slides. So uh, cross that out here. And I wanted to say that A and C are dependent. So the independent sign is crossed out. Okay, so that makes sense. Now in the chain as well, uh, I think again, from an intuitive point of view, it's immediately clear that if you condition on B, if you, for example, control for B in a new regression, then you block this relationship between A and C here in the chain, right? Because uh, B is the, is the mediator that transmits the effect of A on C. And if you block this mediation path, then suddenly A and C become independent. And that is what is denoted here. A and C are independent conditional on B. In the fork, it's actually exactly the same. Uh, in the fork, we again, since B causes A and C, A and C have a common parent, right? That is affecting them both. So A and C will be correlated in our data as well if the underlying causal structure is a fork. So again, A and B are dependent, the independent sign crossed out. But if we condition on this common parent B here, so if we control for it in a regression or we look at different strata of our data, like we did in the Google case, right? We look at each value of B separately, we will find A and C to be independent because um, yeah, we've blocked the common influence factor of A and C B is cannot affect A and C anymore, and what the remaining rest is independent. Okay, so the chain and the fork, they operating exactly the same in terms of, um, you know, stochastics or uh, the underlying statistics, but the collider is different. The collider is uh, exactly the opposite, actually. The collider is such a way that A causes B and C causes B, so in principle, A and C are not related at all. But if we condition on, um, on the variable B here, then we find A and C to be correlated. So it's exactly the flip side of A and C, A and C, yes. It's uh, again the mistake here, A and C are independent. But if we condition on B, we find A and C to be dependent. Um, and yeah, so you see here on the left, that's the graph structure, right? So that's also holds for more elaborate graphs, which I will show you in a second. And this is the statistics side to it. And since there's this connection between the graph or the causal model side and the statistics side, this is what we can use for causal inference. Um, and yeah, uh, that's, that's the D separation uh, theorem, which will be very handy later on for thinking about how uh, the statistics and the causal side to it relate. Um, I, uh, before we go into a break, I want to briefly show you, you this, that this works with the collider in a, um, in a simulation because that might be a little bit unintuitive. So uh, I show you that this actually works in a way I, I told you to. For that, I will uh, go to my R Studio. Um, you can also do this easily in Stata, but I didn't have time, unfortunately, to 
to translate these examples into Stata. Uh, I think you're mainly working with Stata, but uh, yeah, I will walk you through this. So here I um, look at three different variables. I should have called them A, B, and C, but now it's X, Y, and Z. Sorry for that. Um, and I simulate data according to this collider structure here. Okay, so um, I have X and Y that are two, just two, um, two independently normally distributed variables. Right, so X is a vector um, of thousand values that are normally distributed, seen here, and uh, Y the same. So, um, of course, if we then look at the correlation between X and Y, we won't find any meaningful correlation between the two. There's always some uh, sampling noise, of course, right? So it's not exactly zero, but uh, it's, it's really close to zero. And if you would probably run a, a test whether this correlation is significant, you wouldn't find uh, any significant correlation between the two um, because we've set up the problem in that way. Okay, but now I construct a collider uh, and it's the variable Z here. Uh, and for simplicity, I construct this collider as a binary variable. I say that take the sum of X and Y, okay, just sum the X value and the Y value in each row of my data frame, uh, sum them up. And if that sum is larger than zero, I assign here one, otherwise it's a zero. Okay, so that's the one times the parenthesis here. The parenthesis is a logical expression. Is it larger than zero or not? And if so, assign a one or not. Uh, so you can see that X here had positive and negative values, right? And the same for Y. Um, and sometimes this sum turns out to be negative, sometimes positive, and depending on that, I assign a one. So let's see that. Check the Z and we find a bunch of zero and ones. Okay, the mean of this variable should be, since the, the underlying random variables have also mean zero, the mean should be uh, 0.5. Yeah, and we find something very close to 0.5. Okay, so now going back to the collider, Z is my collider here. Now I want to show you that if I condition on different values of Z, that X and Y suddenly turn out to be correlated. Okay, how do I do that in R? Uh, I again use the correlation command here, but I only look at values of X where Z is equal to one, right? So I could, um, for example, um, let's, um, Let's depict them in the, ah, oh no, sorry. Um, I have to C bind them. This is how my data looks like. I don't know why there's no name here, but this is X, this is Y, and this is Z, right? And now if I take the conditional um, correlation, so I condition on values of Z, meaning that I only look at rows where Z is equal to one. So the first row here, the, sec uh, the third row, the fourth row, and the fifth row, and I discard the rows where Z is equal to zero. Or I could do it the other way around, uh, would equally work. Okay, so that what it means to condition on a variable. So I only look at the values of X and Y where Z is equal to one. Okay, and I do that here with the um, with this particular base R syntax. Um, I don't want to explain uh, how R works, but this is um, what what R is doing here. If I type in this command, conditioning on z equal to one, and we now find a correlation which before was zero, is now minus point four eight four eight seven. So a very strong negative correlation between these two variables, um, although X and Y, the way we set it up, were not correlated at all, just because we condition on the, uh, on the collider or the common child of these two variables. I'll show you quickly that if I put in a zero, the same works too. 
um, and we find a correlation of minus 0.45, so also strong negative correlation. So uh, this is the collider. Here, what I exactly what I talked about here, you've seen now in the simulation. So uh, might be a bit strange, but these colliders they actually happen all the time. Uh, so examples would be, uh, for example, um, take a uh, the height of a basketball player, right, and see um, the the shooting average. So how accurate they are at shooting. Uh, and uh, something that people scratch their head uh, for, for years about is that if you look at a set of professional basketball players, let's say NBA players, you often find almost no correlation between height and, um, and sh shooting success, right? Um, and, and that is strange because usually we would expect that there's sort of a relationship between these two variables. But uh, the, probably the underlying problem here is that uh, if you condition on a set of, um, of professional basketball players, you're conditioning on a collider, which messes up the underlying correlation here, right? So um, if, you, if you look at just a random dude, uh, then uh, very much uh, height and shooting average will be correlated. But if you condition on a collider, uh, then this correlation can go away. Or like in our case, as you've seen in the uh, simulations here, you can find a ne strong negative correlation between two variables, although the way it is set up, there's no correlation between them. Okay, um, so I would say that we make a short break, maybe until uh, yeah, 10 minutes, uh, and then we continue at 2.30. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, we had the deseparation in the canonical setting, so the chain forks and colliders, um, and that stuff is pretty useful. Um, first of all, uh, that so we've seen this example here and R, right, to convince you of the colliders. Uh, it's useful because the deseparation doesn't only apply. So you said something there. Maybe you want to make it full screen again. The presentation. Yeah. Um, the deseparation doesn't only apply in, in these canonical structures, but also in larger graphs. Um, and, and that's what makes, makes it useful for, for causal inference is that if you have this example here, um, you cannot only think about the relationship between A, D, and B, which would be a collider here, right? Because A and B cause D, but you can also um, think about, for example, what happens between A and C. So you can think about longer paths between variables. Um, and uh, the same intuition applies, it's just the uh, multiplication of these canonical structures, right? Because what we have here is, first of all, D is a collider. Um, so D blocks this path between A and C, and B, is a is a fork, uh, right? Because B causes D and C. So what happens here between A and C is that in the raw data we would find them to be uncorrelated, um, and I've um, indicated that here. Uh, A and C they would be independent, but if I condition on D, suddenly this path becomes open, right? Like in the in the simulation that we've seen. Um, so since these are collider, if I condition on it, A and C, where is it? Um, A and C condition on D is, is not actually in here. Um, okay. Um, but uh, A and C would then, um, this path would become open and we would find them uh, in the conditional correlation to be correlated. The same goes for B. So if we condition on D, we open up the path. But since B is a fork, if we additionally also control or adjust for B, we close the path again, right? So it's really this, this multiplication of, of opening up or blocking paths. And that uh, applies in, um, in as complicated structures as you wanted to have. Um, 
what you can then do with a graph like this on the left is you can really look at all the possible um, deseparation relationships between variables in the model, right? Like A and C independent, but conditionally on D, they become dependent and so on. Um, and you can list them in a long list of testable implications, right? I had, now I know also why the A and C uh, in the, uh, dependent conditional on D is not in the list because here I only list the, the independence relationships, right? Not the crossed out uh, independence symbols here. So only the independence relationship. And I can write a long list of those. And how are these uh, testable implications helpful? They, helpful? they are helpful for testing whether my model actually complies with the data, right? So if that is my theoretical model, and I would expect A and C to be uncorrelated given this model, if I then go to the data and find a substantial or significant relationship between A and C, that would tell me something's wrong with my model. Right? That's why it's called testable implication because we can test these implications. And that is pretty useful because it, we can first of all think about the, the context and the phenomenon we're studying. We can set up our causal model and say, okay, this is how I think the world works. But then afterwards, how do we know whether this is actually complying with anything meaningful? We can use these testable implications to first of all falsify the model but then also if I find out that A and C are actually correlated, I know exactly how I need to improve the model, right? So these testable implications are very useful. Um, and I want to show you actually a tool uh, that you can work with um, how to find these testable implications. This tool is called uh, Daggerty. Um, you can also implement that in R, but R is a little bit, uh, you know, the syntax is not so nice and, and it's a little bit of coding. I will show this to you in the online version. If you go online to dagady.net, it's called D-A-G for dag and then I-T-T-Y, dagady.net. Uh, and so this is the website for drawing and analyzing causal diagrams. And you can go here on this launch button. And uh, this launches uh, the version of, of Dagerty. And now we can uh, set up, play around, uh, put in a new model. Uh, let's put in this model that, that we had just now. So uh, I click on the screen here, double click I think it is, and put in a new variable called A. And uh, we had a second variable B, C, D and E. So these are the variables in my, in my model. And now I need to um, establish the connections between these two uh, or between the variables, the causal relationships. For that, I click first on one uh, node, double click A, and then I click on another D, and then I have established that A causes D. Right, the same for B. No, that is not correct this way. Right, okay, first on B and then D, and now I have established a connection. Something is, is a bit buggy here. Okay, B causes C and D causes E. Right, so now we have exactly the same structure as it is on the slides here. And Daggerty gives me here on the right hand side the testable implications. Right? So all the testable implications that I have on the slides are also listed here as independence relationships. So I expect A and B to be independent because there's this collider here D between them. I will go back to Daggerty uh, um, later on when we talk about the backdoor adjustment, um, how it's useful for um, causal inference how you can play around with this tool. But for the moment, uh, I just wanted to show you how it works, um, that, that you can find these testable implications here of a DAG. So um, what this means actually, I mean, DAGAD is a computer program, of course, um, is that this deseparation here, we can do this, of course, 
manually, right? We can think hard about this problem and find all uh, these separation relationships, but we don't have to because this problem is easy to teach to a computer. And that's the first connection to the AI literature, right? Deseparation separation is a very useful tool that also computer can understand. Uh, and Daggerty is just a simple JavaScript program, I think, um, that implements this deseparation for as complex graphs as you want them to be, right? You can put a hundred of these nodes into Daggerty and it will easily find you all the testable implications. Okay, one thing um, that is a very interesting topic from an AI point of view is, uh, but that I don't have time, unfortunately, to talk about here, is what we did now is, a so-called theory-driven approach, right? We first uh, set out a model and said, okay, this is how we think the world works. This is uh, how the phenomenon that I'm studying, for example, gender pay gaps, right? This is how the variables in my model relate to each other. And this is what I believe to be true. And then I tested this model based on the testable implications, right? So f theory first and data afterwards. Um, what machine learning people and what AI people um, are actually like to do and what they're trained to do is going the other way around. The other way around would be first to look at the data uh, and you could imagine that you, you take a chunk of, of data, big data set, and you look for all these conditional independence relationships that you find in the data. So you go through all the possible variables and check are they uncorrelated uh, are there uncorrelated also um, conditional on another variable and so on. And you list all these independence relationships. And based on that, you construct your graph. And this is a literature that is called uh, causal discovery or um, causal structure learning, because there you go exactly the other way around. You purely data driven, you first look at the data and you can imagine how computationally intensive this is if you have to look at all these possible um, relationships between uh, the variables, right? Here we just have five, but in reality, there will be, I don't know, hundreds of variables. Uh, you look at all the possible combinations between them, and based on that, what you find, the conditional independence relationships, you construct your graph. Um, I can already tell you so much that this way, the data-driven way never works perfectly. So there's, uh, you can show that in a mathematical proof that going from here to here, you will never be able to fully capture all, uh, um, in every situation, the correct causal structure, right? So often what you end up with is sort of, you can narrow down the space of possible models that are compatible with the data, but you can never narrow it down to just one. There are often more uh, possible models that are, uh, we would say that, uh, that comply with the data. Um, but this is a very interesting way of, of doing um, causal inference. Uh, and it's a very computer science-y, AI-ish way of, of doing things. In econometrics, we are more used to going the other way around. We first uh, used to uh, think about theory, right? Do a literature search, thoroughly analyzing like what has been said on a problem, what is the, the model that we can come up with, and later take it to the data. And that's why I will also stick to this more theory-driven approach here. Um, we can maybe have a second lecture uh, one day on the causal discovery because it's a very interesting uh, approach as well. Okay, uh, now we have the deseparation. Uh, and yeah, uh, usually it, it takes quite a long while until we get there, but now we have all the tools that we need to actually do causal inference. Uh, so we have the, the graphs, we have a way of uh, formalizing our causal assumptions uh, we, we have the deseparation that connects the graphs to the data, and now we can think about what it means to, to do causal inference. Uh, causal inference means that uh, if, we, if we go back to this graph here, right, this is just the way the data generating process, how it uh, appears in, in reality in nature if we just observe it. Right? So Z causes X and Y, and X causes Y. And uh, this is how the data would come in if I, if I just purely passively observe this system of variables. Causal inference now means, though, that um, we want to actually intervene on the system. We want, don't only want to observe it, but now we are interested in what happens if I, for example, change x a little bit. Right? 
what happens then to y? That is, that is my causal uh, question of interest. And uh, for this question, in order to answer it, this influence of Z here is sort of a nuisance, right? Because Z uh, is affecting X and Y at the same time, but I only want to get at the pure effect of X and Y. So I need to deal with this Z. Going back here. So uh, in the same problem that I just showed you, if we're interested in the causal effect of X on Y, we would rather want to get rid of this influence here of Z of x, right? So, so break this dependency and just set x to a specific value and then see what this does to the outcome variable y, right? So in the, um, in, in the policy setting, that would be something like um, research that Dirk and I have done quite a lot on is, is R&D subsidies, for example. And the causal question would be, if I give a firm an R&D subsidy, Right, as a policymaker, what would that do to the firm in terms of growth or innovativeness and so on? Or in the labor market setting, what if I send people to school longer, right? Like for an extra year, let's say, what does this do to their um, to their wages later on in their lives? So that is the cause of question of interest. And uh, yes, yeah, the way this is done in a structural causal model is I before x was determined by some function fx that had the arguments z and ux, right? Remember back here, this one. And now I delete this function from the model. I, I scratch away this, this function and I set x to specific value x0 or x0, right? So either policy on off one part of the of the population gets the subsidy the other not or i just demand that everyone goes 13 years to school instead of 12 years and so on right so i set the value of x to a specific value x0 and then i observe what happens to the other variables in the model right i observe that if i set x to 13 what happens if x is equal to 13 in this function here and ultimately what effect does this have on y no. And this notion of, uh, of wiping out equations, right? This fx that was before is, is wiped away, deleted from the system, and the variable is set to a specific constant x0. That is a very old um, idea that, we've, yeah, uh, that we have implicitly in econometrics since, again, the, the 1950s, 40s uh, even, right? So this is the way how we think about a causal problem. And the computer science people think about this in exactly the same way. So again, you see the connections between the two. We don't use these graphs so much, although uh, we also know about them. Um, but this, this notion of wiping out equations goes back to here, for example, Strotzenwald, 1960s, is very um, familiar to us as economists. What we don't have, uh, is a specific notation for this. Uh, and here it's actually useful to borrow from the computer science literature. Uh, this uh, operation of um, deleting fx from the model and setting x to a specific value x0, we can denote with the do operator here. So if I write do x equal to x0, means exactly that. Get away all the influence factors that affected x beforehand and just set x to a specific value. And then the, the object of interest, the, the causal effect of interest, is uh, what we have down here. It's the distribution of y, our outcome variable, for example, wages or firm growth. Uh, if I do this operation, set x to a specific value. Uh, so translated into a research question, that would be what is the distribution of wages uh, or the probability that you attain a certain wage, given that you've been forced to go to school for 13 years instead of 12 years? Or what is the distribution of firm growth, given that uh, the firm received a subsidy compared to, for example, firms that didn't receive a subsidy? Okay, so that's the, the query of interest, so we're um, the, the object that we want to know. Now it's important 
um, to make this distinction between pre-intervention uh, pre -intervention and post-intervention. Because uh, as I told you before already, the system here as we had it, before we intervened on it, was just purely observing the data, how it came into our spreadsheet, right? We didn't do anything. We didn't intervene on X. We didn't set X to a specific value. We just uh, observed X, Z, and Y in the wild. Um, and then, um, yeah, we can, of course, do all sorts of things with this uh, data. For example, look at the correlation between X and Y. But the intervention that we do in the do case changes the system, right? So before we had the fx here, now x is set to a specific value. So the important thing to note here is that if we do causal inference and we do these manipulations, we change the data generating process and the problem is not the same anymore. And that, we usually capture this with this sort of this bon mot correlation doesn't imply causation, right? And that's exactly formalized here. In the pre-intervention stage, if we don't think about a problem causally and we don't intervene on X, we can just, uh, yeah, we, we observe the variables, the data generating process in the pre-intervention state. And we can, for example, measure the correlation between X and Y. What will happen here though, is that since Z is a parent of X and Y and causing both X and Y, uh, if you remember the deseparation case, this will introduce a correlation between X and Y, right? Because we have this fork structure here. So this correlation between X and Y could also be just driven by this third variable Z here. In the post-intervention setting, we want to rule that case out, right? We want to get at the pure causal effect and that's why we break this relationship here of Z on X. We get rid of all the possible influence factors of X that are in the natural data generating process and we set X to a specific value. Like for example, in a uh, randomized experiment, right? we divide the population up, one part of the population gets the treatment, the other gets the placebo, and then we see what, the, the, what, does, uh, what that does, sorry, to Y, for example, the health status. And uh, so in that sense, it's, it's very similar to the treatment effect literature. Okay, this correlation doesn't apply causation. I want to show you in the, in the R code. Um, yeah, so I, I have that here in the script. Now I set up again uh, a similar system to, to the one that we have here, right? So with X, Y, and Z. And I again use binary variables because um, that makes it easy to adjust for variables, right? Then we can just um, take a two uh, look at two different states uh, and that's the most, uh, you know, the simplest setting possible. So I set up Z as an exogenous variable that has no other influence factors than a background factor EZ. Okay, so Z has no other endogenous variable affecting it. There are no arrows pointing into Z. Um, X, has Z as an influence factor and also uh, a background factor. And Y is causally determined by X and Z and another background factor. And these background factors are again normally distributed. Okay, this time I use a little bit more. Um, well, but we can also work just with a thousand uh, observations. It doesn't have to be so many. Okay, so that's, these are the background factors. Now the endogenous variables. Right? And for example, now I would find um, X and Y to be correlated. There's a correlation of 0.38 and that's due to the, the common parents. Okay, the way I set this up now, that's the pre-intervention stage. That would be if we just observe, passively observe the data, but now we want to do causal inference and we set X to a specific value. Right, so um, I 
scratch off or I delete the function that uh, usually determines x, right? This function here in line 40 of the script. And I set x equal to one, just the simplest case possible, uh, x equal to one. Okay, this is not so, so interesting um, to set x to a constant, so can directly uh, look at what this, uh, what this does to the variable y in the, in the problem. All right, so before y was determined by x and z, and x was a random variable, right, it had zeros and ones. Now I force x to be equal to one, so I exchange the x uh, with a one here. Otherwise, it's exactly the same, okay? So I intervene on x and see what this does to y. And uh, I call this here y do x because x has been set uh, to a specific value via the do operator. Okay, um, let me do all this. Yeah. And I put them into a data frame. Um, so we can also look at this here. And uh, so we have our three variables, x, y, and z, and y do x. And the first thing to note is that um, y and y do x are not the same, right? So the pre-intervention stage and the post-intervention stage are not the same. You see that here, for example, in my simulation in, um, in row 18, we have a y is equal to zero, but y do x is equal to one. So that's the difference between the pre and the post intervention stage. The second thing to note is that in reality, of course, now we simulated the data and we know exactly what's going on. But in reality, you would not know this y do x, right? In reality, this, um, this y do x is unobserved because in reality, we can um, not do this intervention ourselves. So all that we're having is x, y, and z, and we want to infer this y do x, and that's the causal inference problem. And uh, now I want to show you that correlation doesn't imply causation, um, because I um, will now simply look at the mean of um, this y do x. And so I look at the, the mean of this fourth column here. That will be equal to the causal effect of x and y with binary variables, because it's the, uh, the mean is the probability that y is equal to one, given uh, that x has been set to one. Okay. This causal effect is equal to 0.32. But in reality, as I said, I don't observe this y do x. I cannot just uh, simply look at this and compute it for my data. I just have, uh, sorry, that's wrong. That's the data from, I just have x, y, and z, right? And what, uh, what do I do with this? I could just simply look at the correlation between y and x and hope that this gives me something causal. And I, uh, with binary variables, it's very simple to look at a correlation. I just look at uh, the mean of y, so the probability that y is equal to one, if x is equal to one in the pre-intervention stage. And if I run this, then I see that I find uh, a causal effect of equal to uh, 0.4, roughly, which is quite far away from the true causal effect equal to 0 0.32. Okay, just to um, reiterate, since I did the simulation here, I know exactly the data generating process, I can compute the actual causal effect, which uh, is just the mean of this fourth column here. But in reality, I, I would not be able to do this. I have to work with X, Y, and Z as they are observed in a pre-intervention stage. And if I then, with this data, simply look at the correlation between Y and X, I find uh, a correlation that is much too high, that doesn't reflect the true causal effect. And that's, that's a problem, obviously, right? 
um, that uh, the correlation and what, what I can observe is the correlation in the data and that doesn't give me a meaningful true causal effect. I uh, wanted to quickly stop whether there are any questions. I don't see any popping up in the chat, but is that clear with the simulation so far? If not, then please raise your hand. Okay, we seem to be doing fine or everyone is at sleep at home. Okay, um, so we had the simulation over here. Okay, um, yeah. So now comes uh, probably the most technical part of the lecture a little, a little late in the afternoon, but I hope we get through it um, because what we need to think about now is we, we've established this notion of uh, an intervention, right? We have this do operator now here, but this do operator is sort of non-standard, right? It's not uh, reflecting anything uh, that we know from standard probability theory. From probability theory, we know, just know how to work with these conditional distributions, right? What I just uh, did in the simulation, I looked at the conditional probability of Y given X. I see there's a question I will uh, just uh, in a minute uh, look at it. But just to finish the thought, so in the simulation, I looked at the conditional probability of y given x. That is something that I could observe. What I couldn't observe was the true causal effect y given do x, because post-intervention and pre-intervention is not the same. Um, and now we need a way to translate this do operator, something that remains unobserved, into an object that we actually can observe with observational data with pre-intervention data okay and this will be um, the the role of the of the do calculus that we have over here but let me first look at the the chat yes so saha asked do you think uh, is it a good idea to keep the pre-intervention stage but just simply control for z so we do not fix x anymore um that's exactly what we're going to do uh, so um if you want to get at a true causal effect uh, in the pre-intervention stage here and uh, you uh, you're already thinking ahead is uh, how can we break this uh, spurious correlation that is uh, introduced by z we will control or just for this uh, variable z here. And, and by that, uh, we can get actually at the causal effect of interest, right? Um, with the help of pre-intervention data, but we're not there yet. Uh, we, have to, we have to first um, talk about a few other things, but that is uh, where, we, where we're heading. Very good. Okay. Um, the do calculus. Um, the do calculus is a set of three rules um, that help us to deal with these do operators. Um, and this slide looks a little bit messy and technical, uh, but I will um, just explain the intuition to you. Um, the do calculus, if you look, for example, here at rule two, what we want to achieve with the do calculus is you see here. Um, this do operator do z okay, in an expression that we might want to ask ourselves from the data. So we want to know what is the effect uh, of intervening on z on a variable y, but we cannot observe this do operator over here. And the do calculus is there uh, in order to get rid of these do operators. And you see that here in rule two, under certain conditions, that are put out here on the right. Uh, and these conditions always relate to the structure of the graph. We can actually get rid of this do operator over here and replace it with the normal z over here. And if we've done that, if we got rid of the do operator, then uh, we are left with an object 
that we can observe and that we can estimate from the data. I will show you uh, an example in a second, but again, there was a question in the chat. Okay, no worries, Saha writes, so we can continue. Okay, let me illustrate to you in a very simple example what this means here. Uh, take the rule two of the do calculus and assume we are interested in this object. Um, no, that's, a, that's the rule two here we, uh, that we're gonna apply. Let's assume we're interested in the following object. So we want to know the probability of Y given that we intervene on Z. So it's the causal effect of Z on Y and another we condition on another variable W. Right, so that's our query of interest. And uh, I said the do calculus relates um, do objects to the structure of the graph. Let's say we have a simple causal model that is here on the left. So the graph G, we, uh, we assume that W affects Z and Z affects Y. And then there's an unobserved correlation or confounder between W and Y. So there's an unobserved variable um, that affects W and Y at the same time and thus creates a correlation between the two. Okay, our goal is now to get rid of this do operator because we can't observe it, right? We want to get rid of the do operator and translate this object into something uh, that we can actually observe from the data. And for that, we use rule two of the do calculus because this rule uh, two tells me that I can exchange the do z with a normal z. So I can get rid of the do uh, operator if a certain condition holds in my graph. And what is the condition that needs to hold? Uh, it looks a bit uh, ugly, but uh, we go through it uh, one by one, it's not so difficult actually. It means the condition is that Y has to be independent of Z. So Y has to be independent of Z. Conditional on X and W in the graph G. And um, now that is the probably the most tricky part here. Uh, not in the overall graph, but in a graph where we delete all the arrows that point N to X and all the arrows that are emitted by Z. Okay, take a deep breath. Um, G is our graph and to repeat again, this overscore X means that from G, we delete all the arrows that point into X. Okay, in our G, we don't have an X, so we can forget about this. The second condition here is we not only delete all the arrows pointing into X, the overscore X, right, overscore X. Um, we also delete all the arrows that are omitted by Z. That's the underscore Z here, okay? In our graph, that would mean Z emits one arrow pointing into Y and we scratch that off from the model or we delete this arrow. So in our case, the GZ underscore is the graph down here, okay? So we um, apply rule two of the do calculus for, for this expression over here by recognizing that in GZ underscore, this graph here, the condition on the right-hand side is fulfilled because Z and Y are independent of each other if I block the path that goes from here to here. Okay, so once more, Z has to be independent of Y. At the moment here in this graph, it is not because there's still this, this backdoor path here going from Z to W to Y. So remember, the, uh, the D separation also worked with a fork structure, for example. You could think about this W here as a fork affecting both Z and Y. Right? So at the moment, they're still uh, correlated with each other, even though I deleted this arrow over here. But I can get rid of this correlation by conditioning on W. Right? And that is what is done, uh, what, is, uh, what this condition here says. Y and Z have to be independent, conditional on W 
in the graph where I deleted this error over here. So the condition applies and I can, um, I can thus use rule two of the do calculus uh, and it means that uh, I can uh, replace this do z operator here with the normal z. Okay, so as I said, most technical uh, after two hours of lecture, lecturing, um, you can maybe have in a, in a quiet minute, uh, look at this once more. It's a ju just a simple example. Um, and I won't go through, through all these rules because the, the bottom line and silver lining here is that um, in the end, we don't need to care about to do calculus anymore because the computer will do all this stuff for us. We will teach the computer how to do this and we don't have to bother with this anymore. I just showed it to you anyways, this example, because I want to sharpen your intuition about what's happening here. Um, I wanted to show you that, first of all, what is the goal? The goal was to get rid of this do operator. Do z, we have translated it into something that doesn't contain a do operator anymore. And why we did that? Because this object here on the right is just a standard conditional probability. And this conditional probability, I can easily estimate from the pre-intervention data. Okay, so that step is crucial. And we've used the Duke calculus for this. And the second intuition is, how did we do this? The Duke calculus uh, allows me to translate these do um, expressions into, into other expressions. So it's very much like the algebra that you learned in, in fifth grade in school, right? So, translate one equation into one another. Uh, it's exactly the same here, just with these two operations. And also in algebra, there are certain rules that you need to apply, right? Like uh, an additive operator operates differently than a multiplication, right? There are different uh, rules um, that you need to apply to, to do the algebra in these cases. And here with the do calculus, it's exactly the same. It depends on the conditions put on the graph and these are here on the right, right? So certain uh, independence relationships here between Y and Z have to hold in the graph. I also was deleting some, some arrows over here. Um, that was the condition down here. Uh, but the important thing to note is based on the structure of the graph, that allows me to do something with these two objects. You see that the other rules are exactly in the same style. There's again a different condition here on the variables in the graph. And if that holds, then I can, for example, here, the, there's a conditional on Z in this object here, and I can get rid of this completely. So that's rule one, it's insertion and deletion of observations. The third rule again allows me to, um, in the second rule here, I exchange the do Z with the normal Z. The third rule allows me actually to get completely rid of the do z and uh, yeah, get away uh, completely with it based on another condition on the graph over here. But I will not get into the details here. It's enough if you saw one example. Okay, so that's the do calculus. Now, why, why do we do this? Right? Why, why should we care? What does this bring us? This do calculus is actually uh, a very powerful uh, and flexible tool uh, that we can use for all sorts of uh, causal inference problems. And in the remainder of this lecture, I just want to adjust, want to give you a gist about all the cool stuff that you can do with this do calculus. And as I already said, in the end, I will talk a bit about um, how we can actually teach this do calculus to the computer so that we don't need to bother anymore about it. We don't need to algebra, uh, do the algebra ourselves, but we can just let the computer uh, work for us. Uh, and that's pretty cool. Okay, so um, I've showed you in the example, what is the goal? The goal is to repeatedly apply these rules of do calculus to a certain problem until we found a way of translating these do objects, p, y, do, x, into something that doesn't um, contain a do operator anymore. And that's what we can estimate from the data. So that's the, the way how we uh, apply. Do calculus very much like, you know, you've been presented in school with an equation. That equation is not yet 
easy to solve, then you change the equation as much so that in the end you have x equals five. And that's how you solve the equation, right? And uh, in the same way, you apply the do calculus. What has been shown and what is actually very important for causal inference is that the do calculus just contains three rules, right? So although it looks a bit messy here, um, it's actually pretty simple, just three rules. There are three rules. There are uh, not a thousand you know, algebraic rules. There are not uh, uh, hundreds of laws of mathematics that you need to remember. It's just three rules. Uh, but these three rules, they're actually complete meaning that they are enough to uh, solve all possible problems that uh, causal inference problems that are out there in these recursive um, uh, structural causal models, right? Or in, in the directed asymptotic graphs. So it applies uh, only for, for, for the DAC um, model world. But in that world, the do calculus is complete, meaning that we can solve all the possible causal inference problems with it, so either that, or if the do calculus fails, which could be the case, right? So we are not able to translate the do uh, expression into something else. Then we know for sure that no solution exists, right? So when I say that do calculus is complete, I'm not saying it's like a magic wand that solves all your problems. Sometimes there exists no solution for a given problem. Uh, but in that case, do calculus will tell us that there is no solution. And that's a pretty important property too, right? Because imagine you try to apply the do calculus and find no solution. Now, if you don't know that do calculus is complete, you, you cannot be sure, you know, is there maybe another way of coming to a solution with, with a different approach than the do calculus? Um, so in that sense, the do calculus would only be sufficient. If there's a solution, we find it with do calculus. But if, there's, uh, if we don't find a solution with the do calculus, uh, we cannot be sure that maybe there's a different approach to do it. But here, because of the completeness property, we can also be sure, OK, there's no other way. OK, if the do calculus fails, no other way, and the problem is not solved. Um, and uh, this completeness property uh, that was actually a major breakthrough in this causal AI literature. Uh, and it's really hard to prove. Um, it's, it's a really complicated mathematical proof, um, but uh, it's, it's very powerful um, because now we know that all the three rules of Duke calculus they're enough to solve all the solvable problems that are out there. Um, so that was the first step in 2006, um, to the completeness proof. The second part of it is um, that the do calculus can be automated. We don't have to do that ourselves. Uh, and uh, that's how we're gonna teach causal reasoning to a robot or a computer. What I, in the remainder, I have, uh, yeah, okay, we're very good in time. Um, what I want to show you is just a couple of applications of this do calculus and convince you like how, um, how universal uh, and flexible this tool is. Uh, and what I will show you is, is different sets of problems that we encounter all the time in, um, in econometric research, also in, yeah, in all sorts of empirical research basically. Uh, data problems such as selection bias, um, instrumental variable uh, types of estimation, confounding um, bias. And I will probably, you've already encountered these problems uh, before in the lecture or elsewhere. And I will sort of reframe, phrase them or reframe them in the do calculus way uh, and show you how do calculus uh, can solve or deal with these problems. Um, so yeah, the, the four main topics we are talking about in the paper and I will talk about here is dealing with confounding bias, uh, using surrogate experiments. So this is the IV case, the instrumental variable case, the selection bias case, and um, what computer science people call transportability. Um, social scientists would call this external validity. So the idea of what happens to my estimates if I obtain them in one certain domain, are they also applicable in a different context? Uh, and we will get into that. 
by the way, I should use full screen mode again. Okay. Um, and what I will show you then as well, or what will be the outcome of this is what we call the data fusion process. Um, because the do calculus works in the way that here on the left, that is our job as a researcher, right? So if we're doing empirical research, we have to formulate a causal query of interest for a specific target population. The second ingredient that we need is a model um, expressed as a causal graph here. And the third thing that we need is the available data that we are having, right? And we, I will get into that uh, in, a, in a second, what this means, but do we have experimental data? Do we have observational data? Do we have selection bias data and so on? That's the thing that we need to care about. These, that's the three ingredients that we need. Then we submit all of this to our causal inference engine and this causal inference engine is based on the do calculus. And this causal inference engine then will give me either an estimable expression of Q, right? So what we've seen in the, in the slide before, um, something that we can estimate from the data, or it will tell me that no solution exists. Sorry. Uh, and this whole process of first formulating a model, coming up with a research question and supplying the available data and doing the measuring, what is happening? Sorry. Um, then passing that over to the causal inference engine and then getting uh, a solution out, that is the, the data fusion process. Okay, so first task, the confounding bias. Uh, and uh, I think Saad was, uh, was already thinking about this uh, ahead, the um, controlling way uh, the influence of a third variable Z. That is exactly what we're thinking about here, right? Confounding bias is what you do all the time implicitly in econometrics. You're thinking about a, a relationship between two variables. Here, for example, a college is, uh, having a college degree on wages. That's the example that I'm using here. But there are other variables out there in the, in the data generating process in the model that um, introduce a spurious relationship between these two variables and we need to get rid of this. Yeah. So a simple example down here, we're interested in the effect of C on Y. So having a college degree on future earnings, but there are other variables such as the occupation that I'm working in with. So management or non-management, for example. Um, there's a, uh, a fourth variable work-related health that could be relevant here, right? So maybe people that go to college are more healthy on average than um, blue collar workers because they work you know, in the office and not in a factory. Uh, and so the work-related health might be an important variable to consider here and that can also have an effect on my future earnings. And there are other socio-economic uh, socio factors, sorry, uh, E, for example, my, my parents' income, um, my, my gender could be one, uh, and so on, right? So this is a stylist example, of course, again, but uh, these are the variables that I'm considering here. And let's assume that the causal structure is as such, that um, these socioeconomic factors, they're uh, affecting both whether I have a college degree and my future earnings at the same time. So think about my parents' income, it's very relevant for whether I go to college or not. And at the same time, uh, will also affect probably my future earnings. Um, then work-related health is an outcome of having a college degree here in this example, uh, exactly because what I said earlier that working in an office like me in front of a laptop uh, is probably not uh, as detrimental. Um, no, sorry. Uh, the health is H, uh, I was already pushing ahead. Um, there's an indirect relationship between Z and uh, work-related health, um, as I said, uh, but this is mediated by, by my occupation, right? So if I go to college, I'm more likely to have a blue-collar, uh, white-collar job, sorry, 
working in an office uh, and that's positive for my health, for example, and that affects then uh, my future earnings. So this is an example that is uh, taken from, from uh, mostly harmless econometrics, so it's sort of a standard teaching example in econometrics. Okay, so what is the confounding bias now? I want to know the P Y given do C, right? So if I would randomly allocate people to having a college degree or not, uh, what would that uh, do to their future earnings? But of course, I cannot do this manipulation myself, right? I cannot force people to go to school. That would be uh, highly unethical. Uh, no uh, IVR board would, uh, would allow such an experiment to run. We can maybe encourage them to, do, uh, to, to go to school by you know, giving them school vouchers or so, but uh, the experiment itself is probably not able or not feasible. So then we're left with the problem that we want to know the PY do X or do C in this case, but we need to estimate this object here purely based on pre-intervention data where we're not intervening ourselves. Um, and so we need to use the rules of do calculus in order to change this object here that we cannot measure. Uh, and we need to transform this object here into an object that we can observe from the data. This is task here is uh, also what we call the identification task because we need to translate an object that is unobservable into something that we can observe and that we can, in a, in a sense, identify. That's where the no, uh, word comes from. Okay. So we could now use the rules of do calculus in order to do this, in order to translate this P, Y, do C into something that we can observe. Uh, and I actually have the, uh, the derivations here. You see um, it's like two slides long, so not too long. Again, you know, deleting some errors from the model, applying the rules of due calculus rule two and rule three, and at the end we arrive at something that we can estimate. Um, but I don't want to, in the interest of time, I don't want to go through this. Uh, I want to apply a shortcut, um, the so-called backdoor adjustment. Um, backdoor adjustment is uh, what we do all the time in econometrics if we introduce control variables in our regressions. Um, and it's a special case of the do calculus. Uh, because if we look at the graph down here again, we see that there are, um, that W and H, right? They are outcomes of variable C. So they are um, partial mediators of the effect of C. C affects W and W has an effect on Y and the second mediation chain C, W, H and Y. Um, so we probably don't want to control for these W and H variables because otherwise we would block one path, one causal path by which C affects Y, right? So again, with the deseparation, we have sort of a chain here, a causal chain, and then we don't want to block these, these paths because they are part of the effect of C on Y. There's a direct effect, but uh, also an indirect effect by a W and H. The E is different though. The E affects C through the back door, and that's where the name comes from, because E has an effect on C, and E also has an effect on Y. So there's this fork here, and this creates a spurious correlation. This is not a causal correlation, between C and Y via this path, because the, the arrow goes against the, the direction, right? So it's not C having an effect on E, but the other way around. And that's why we have this sort of backdoor influence. And the backdoor criterion now says that um, W and H are fine. We don't want to control for them, but the, these backdoor factors that create a spurious relationship between C and Y, those we want to get rid of and we get rid of them by adjusting for them. And uh, so here I'm, I'm rushing ahead a bit and I will show you uh, this in, in the simulation just to give you uh, an intuition for this. But what I will find with the help of this backdoor criterion by adjusting for this variable E that we have identified as sort of this confounder that creates a spurious relationship, 
um, is this adjustment formula down here. This adjustment formula tells me that my query of interest py of do c, right? I can translate that into an object here on the right that doesn't contain any do operator. And that's exactly this identification part that we want, uh, or identification task that we wanted to accomplish. Right, and how is this, um, how, is the, how does this object look like? We condition on all uh, values of E. Right, we take the conditional probability of Y given C and E, and then integrate or take the average over all values of E. Right. And uh, this written down here with uh, sorry discrete probability variables uh, maybe looks a little bit alien to you, but what this is is a simple regression. Okay, uh, in a non-parametric way, so no linear regression, you don't have the uh, alpha plus beta and so on. Uh, this is for discrete values and uh, no functional form assumptions, but you condition on E and then you average over all possible values of E. That's just the regression uh, where we control for E. Okay, so it's very similar to what you've encountered before. Um, yeah, so first now I want to show the, this to you in the simulation. Um, because remember, we had the problem from before, Z, X, and Y. And if we looked at the simple correlation between Y and X, we found um, an effect or correlation that was not the same as the causal effect of interest, right? 3.9 was not the same as 0 0.32, the actual causal effect. So that's the confounding problem that we're dealing with. But now we have this adjustment formula that tells us we can get at the true causal effect by applying this formula over here. Right? And uh, just, to, just to show you once more, uh, yeah. So the backdoor criterion also applies here in this case. Right? This is the data how we set it up. We had just one simple confounder Z. And now we want to adjust for this with the help of the adjustment formula. Yeah. Okay, how does that look like in R? Um, the adjustment formula is uh, written down here. We first take the probability of Y, so the mean with binary variables is always an easy way to compute probabilities, right? Because the mean and the probability is the same for binary variables we take the probability of y given that x is equal to one and z equal to one. Um, here, the probability of y given that x is equal to one and um, z is equal to one. Right. Then we do uh, multiply by the probability that e is equal to one. And then we do this for all the values that E can take. And here there are just two variables. That's why I'm working with binary variables. Uh, so we do again the same if E is equal to zero, right? So probability of Y given X equal to one, Z is equal to one times the probability that Z is equal to one. And now plus probability that X is equal to one, Z is equal to zero. The second value, possible value of Z times the probability that z is equal to zero. And now I let this run. And what we want is via this adjustment formula to get at a true causal effect. And we're getting pretty close. Okay, so this is, uh, it's not as close as I hoped it to be. I mean, there's always a uh, sort of a uh, small sample variation in there, right? If we would let this problem run a second time, we would probably get closer. You've seen that in the simulations that Dirk has shown to you before already. Um, but we are at least much closer than the simple correlation, right? By the simple adjustment formula here. Um, let's maybe try this once more. Let's simulate the second time data. And uh, now we're actually much doing much better. So the small sample variation is, is more in favor in our sense here. The true causal effect is again 0.321. The correlation is 0.378. So 
quite far off. And the adjustment formula gives me the correct causal effect. Uh, and to um, stress once more, by only using variables that I actually observed, x, y, and z. The y do x, I was not looking at, because in reality, I could not observe it. OK, so um, I told you this here on the right is actually just a, a regression, a non-parametric regression. Uh, but what do we do with this in practice? Um, once you found an, uh, a suitable adjustment set, like E here in this case, you can basically apply any estimator that you want. Right? Once you've solved the identification task, the estimation part is sort of an afterthought. Um, so what you could use here is um, I use binary variables and I applied this expression here, brute force. But uh, it would equally work if you do, for example, a nearest neighbor matching on inverse probability weighting. Um, also, a regression would work, but only if the underlying relationships are linear. Okay, and in the way I set up the data with binary variables that doesn't hold anymore. Or, uh, no, actually, here in this case, uh, you could run a, a full, um, yeah, if you include all the interaction terms, it would also work. Uh, but yeah, linear regression only if the underlying relationships are linear. And remember, we didn't make these functional form assumptions. We want to stay fully non parametric. Um, but then you can apply matching or inverse probability weighting or what, what have you. Uh, I showed this to you here for, for those of you who are interested. Um, Maybe you've never heard about inverse probability weighting, then unfortunately we don't have time to talk about this. But here I do um, the, um, I, uh, do the same as above here with the adjustment formula with the help of inverse probability weighting. I just look uh, at, the, um, at the probability of x in every strator of z. Okay, so that's how I condition on z in the inverse probability case. And uh, then I divide by these weights that I've constructed. So the inverse probability, the probability is a weight. I divide by that and I find um, uh, wait, what is happening? I should get at the uh, mean no something is off um something's wrong with the code because i should get at the two Okay, I've deleted some lines in the code and something was messed up. I, um, I need to look, look that up. Um, maybe that goes too far, but uh, now I have it in some other script. So uh, I will send you a corrected version of the script and you can check that yourself. Um, so of course now a bit unfortunate um, because uh, didn't work as intended, but uh, trust me in principle, the inverse probability weighting should work. So once we uh, solve the identification task, then we will be able to, to use any sort of estimator, uh, be it matching, be it inverse probability uh, weighting to uh, do this adjustment over here. Okay, um, that was the vector adjustment. Uh, here's the definition of how we find these vector um, sets. What I want to show you is a more complicated example here um, and a more complicated graph, not just three variables, right? So something that might be more realistic. Uh, so here we have X and Y that we're interested in and six other variables and quite some complicated causal structure between them. Uh, and the purpose of this example here is to show you that in uh, many real life applications, the uh, set of suitable control variables that I need to um, 
uh, that I need to include in my regression is often much smaller than the total number of variables in, in the model. Right? So it's, um, the Eve approach would be here if I'm thinking about a relationship between X and Y, like again, college on wages, and I have six other variables that I think are important, a naive way would be to simply um, include all of them in a regression. Right? And this example here shows you that um, I've listed down here the minimum sufficient adjustment sets. So all the sets that would be sufficient in order to get at the causal effect of X and Y with the help of the Spector criterion. Um, and these sets, they're usually much smaller than all the variables in the model, right? So here in this example, it would be W2 would be a minimum sufficient adjustment set, meaning that if I only control for W2, that would be enough to get at the effect of X and Y. Why is this the case here? The W2 is the only variable or the last variable that points into X. Right, so this is uh, W2 is very important for affecting uh, X and assigning units to the treatment. And if I control for this, all the biasing paths are blocked. Uh, so W2 would be the smallest possible adjustment set. Um, of course, you can also uh, control for many more variables. So another sufficient adjustment set would be W2, W3, W4, W5. Um, so four variables in the regression, but you already see that this would be not necessary. And if I set out the graph like it is here, and if this is my causal model, W2 is already sufficient. I don't need to also include W3, W4, W5. And that's uh, great, of course, you know, first of all, it saves me lots of data collection efforts because now I only need to know why X and W2. Uh, and not W3, W4, W5. Maybe W5 is uh, super hard to measure. Maybe it's a variable that is very costly to, uh, to measure and I can just get rid of this uh, and disregard this completely by looking at W2. Um, the second thing here is um, uh, that makes the problem even more subtle is if you look at all these adjustment sets, all the variables that would be suitable as control variables, you will never find W1 in there. And uh, why is this the case? W1 here is a collider, right? Because these two arrows point into W here and here uh, and uh, driven by unobserved variables. If I control or adjust for W1 in my regression, I condition on the collider and according to deseparation, that opens the path between X and Y. So here's even in this problem, a pitfall, sort of a trap that I can uh, walk into. Uh, by, condition, by including W1 in my regression, I um, create a spurious correlation between X and Y that wasn't there before. Right? And this uh, actually happens quite a lot in empirical research. If we don't think, hard enough about the causal structure, we might just simply, you know, mindlessly throw variables into our regression, find a correlation between X and Y that could be simply driven by these colliders. So this is a cautionary tale um, to tell you that you actually need to think hard about the underlying causal structure, because if you trap into these, uh, or if you, if you walk into these, the traps of the collider, you could actually make the problem worse by controlling for things uh, than, than it was before. Right? So two main takeaways here, the sufficient adjustment sets are often much smaller than the uh, full number of variables in the model. W2 would be already enough. And uh, you need to watch out for these colliders because they can uh, introduce bias that wasn't there before. I've seen there's a, there is a question in the chat. Wait, how do I get to the chat again? What about if there's another arrow from W3 to X? 
but we just don't know it. Still controlling from W2 is enough? Um, no, uh, because then W3, there would be a, a backdoor path, right? X, W3, and here. And then W2 would be not sufficient adjustments. Then. Yeah, that's right. So uh, good thinking, Sa. Very good questions. Um, so depending on the, the causal relationships in the model, just the absence of one error um, can change the, the problem completely. Right? That's why it's important to think so clearly about all the variables that I have in my regression and the causal relationships between two, the, the two of them. Um, I want to quickly show you how this works in Daggerty. How we can uh, again use Daggerty for this. Um, let me put in a new model and a sort of simplified version of the college wage premium example. So I put in W Y E. I specify the causal relationships between the, uh, them, right? W, uh, C affects W and C, uh, W affects Y, E affects C, E affects Y. And now in the, in the example here, I also had these unobserved variables, right? In Daggerty, I can uh, put them in as such. I specify a variable U, U1 for unobserved variable one that is affecting C and E. And another variable U2, nothing to do with Bono. Uh, and I then hover with the, with the cursor over these variables and I press the U button. That tells Daggerty that this variable is an unobserved variable. I, it is in the model, but I don't observe it. The same for U2. And I specify this as unobserved. And now the last thing I need to tell Daggerty in order to, um, to use it, I need to tell Daggerty the treatment and the outcome. Uh, and C here is my treatment variable. Um, Daggerty calls this actually an exposure. This is more like health, um, health sciences uh, syntax. We would call this a treatment, but I hover again with the, um, with the cursor over it and press the E button. So then C is identified as the exposure and Y uh, is the outcome with an O. Okay, and now Dagony knows my model. And I told you earlier that E is a sufficient adjustment set here. And this is what Daggerty gives me as well. So Daggerty tells me that the minimal sufficient adjustment sets for estimating the total effect of C on Y is E. And it also tells me the testable implication that W and E are uncorrelated or independent given C. So uh, this is how you could play around in, uh, with your own applications and in your own research. Right, so you can use Daggerty and, um, for example, check what happens if the arrow here is going in the other direction, right? Suddenly we have two backdoor paths. Uh, these confounding variables are indicated here in red. And suddenly I have to control for E and W, right? So you can check what happens uh, if, if you change the causal structure. And you can also put in more complicated problems like like this here, uh, and then Daggerty will give you uh, all the minimum efficient adjustments that I actually um, computed all those, not by myself. I didn't sit, you know, two hours in the evening and compute all the sufficient adjustment sets. I used the Daggerty program. Uh, I used it in R, uh, but it's the same underlying, uh, the same underlying program. So that works, works very easily. Okay, we had the R example, the backdoor adjustment. Um, just to reiterate what happened here, uh, the confounding bias was we translated the do object here into something that we can actually observe and estimate. It didn't work with the inverse probability uh, because my code was not correct, but uh, in principle that works as well. And uh, that's how we solved 
the identification problem uh, and the backdoor is just a shortcut to it. In the backdoor uh, criterion, we work more with the structure of the graph, right? So it's a little bit more intuitive, but what is underlying this is actually the rules of due calculus. And you can check that over here. Okay, sometimes in applications, we, um, we find out that there is actually no sufficient adjustment set. Right, um, we, we will put in a graph um, and Dagedy will tell us that, you know, sorry, uh, there is no sufficient adjustment set. And also the new calculus will tell us that, um, that there's no solution to the problem. So there's no simple uh, regression solution to, uh, to estimate a causal effect of interest. What we can do then in these situations is, is a different thing um, is, uh, using so so-called surrogate experiments and this is the iv case um right so here i have an example uh in the graph on the right where i'm interested in the effect of x and y and here if you put that into daggedy it will tell you that there's no possible way um, of identifying the causal effect of x and y why uh you know simple backdoor adjustment why is that? Because we have this uh, backdoor path here via Z, right? So X, Z, and Y, which creates a spurious correlation. So I would like to control for Z, but at the same time, Z is a collider. So if I control for Z, I open up this path over here, here, and here. So there's no way around this problem. Um, what I could do here, though, if I'm able to um, intervene on a third variable z, and that will be my surrogate experiment uh, that has a causal effect on x, then I am, might be able to solve the confounding problem here with the help of the surrogate experiment. Um, so think about an uh, instrumental variable like z that affects my treatment of interest, right? z affects x, and then x affects y. And an instrumental variable is always uh, something randomized, right? So um, the, the instrument is, is a random variable that affects Z and X. Uh, no, uh, is a random variable Z that affects X and that will be my instrument. An example of this uh, would be from development economics, um, the so-called encouragement designs. Uh, so Esther DeFlo, Nobel Prize winner in economics last year, has written about this a lot. So suppose we cannot, um, for example, send people to school uh, in a randomized experiment, randomized control trial, right? I talked about this, that this would be an unethical thing to do. But maybe we can encourage them to go longer to school by, for example, uh, waiving their tuition uh, or giving them financial aid uh, to go longer to school. And that would be a third variable Z, for example, school voucher affecting how long I go to school. Uh, and by that also has an indirect effect on earnings that I care about. So this would be a classic encouragement design. In the, in the Dukakles cases, um, the surrogate experiment changes the task that we're up to. Uh, because before, or like before, we have the same causal effect of interest, the PY do X. And in the identification task before, we wanted to translate this object into something that we can observe, um, something that didn't contain a do operator at all. And that was the task that we had before. Now, if we can run a surrogate experiment, so we can actually um, intervene on a third variable Z, this changes the task because now we can translate this object into something that contains a do Z, but not a do X. Okay, this is the way uh, how we use surrogate experiments. So the, the identification task changes because we can observe additional objects. And that's why we also call this identification task Z identification. Um, and the solution in this example over here would look like the following. Again, I use the computer to, um, to derive at this expression and I didn't do it myself. Uh, so I use the, these alg um, 
identification algorithms that I will talk about in a minute. But what you see here is our object of interest on the left translated into something that doesn't contain a do x anymore, but a do z only. Because this, in the surrogate experiments case, this is something we can observe. We can actually manipulate the voucher, uh, the school voucher, or we can, um, yeah, other examples would be, uh, we can, no, nah, uh, okay, I, I don't want to talk about other examples uh, because we're already short on time. But uh, we, we have this surrogate experiment and we use it in order to ease our identification task. Um, we now obtain a solution that is observable with the help of surrogate experiments that wasn't solvable for purely observational data. Um, yeah. So, as I said earlier, this Z identification is very similar to instrumental variable uh, estimation because you have here the canonical structure of, a, uh, of the instrumental variable estimator where Z affects an X x affects y, uh, x and y are confounded, right? So that's where the, the problem comes into, but z is a totally exogenous variable. But the two are not exactly the same. Um, we describe that in, in the paper if you're interested in what the differences between uh, instrumental variable estimation and the z identification is, but in um, conceptually, the two things are very similar. So that's the z identification task. With the help of do calculus, we can arrive at an expression using surrogate experiments that help us to uh, get at the causal effect of interest. Okay. Now we had the second application of the do calculus. The third application would be the section bias case. Um, and it again is very similar in, uh, in structure. Because in practice, uh, often a problem that we encounter is that we don't measure variables or that we don't have a non-selected sample for the population, right? And usually we want to have, uh, we want to measure our variables, our data in a way that it's representative for a certain population, let's say all the students at KO Leuven. Yeah. But uh, in reality, that is often not the case, uh, that our sample is often non-representative, right? It doesn't really reflect the, um, the underlying population of interest. One uh, very interesting example, I think, uh, is recently a paper by, by Knox et al. Um, critiquing um, the, um, the literature on racial bias and policing. Uh, because an important problem in, in economics and in, in crime related studies is that we, um, we want to know whether there's a racial bias in the police force, right? Whether minorities are, for example, uh, more often the victim of uh, police violence or stopped more often, interrogated more often. Uh, and if that is the case, we want to intervene, right? We want to implement policies to reduce this racial bias. Um, and there's been a long literature, people like uh, Roland Fryer and so on um, at Harvard uh, looking into this and finding, you know, that there is actually racial bias. Uh, so that black uh, persons in the US, for example, are more often the, um, the, the victim of police viol uh, violence. Um, but the problem with this kind of literature is that it's all based on administrative data. Uh, and administrative data has the structure that, uh, you know, there's only a record of you in police data if you have been stopped by the police, right? So the police doesn't uh, collect a random sample of people uh, and they don't go through town and uh, randomly interrogate people. They uh, interrogate people for good reason because maybe they have an underlying suspicion and only then if they interrogated you, then there will be a record of you on file. Right? Problem is that the stopping, as I said, uh, is not itself a, a random decision, but uh, related to fundamentals. And uh, you could very well think about a situation where your minority status, so whether you're black or Latino, uh, affects the, the decision by the police uh, whether they should stop you or not. Right? So either stop you randomly on the streets but uh, or in your car or whatever. 
right? And this is already a, a situation where an implicit bias could creep in, right? If uh, police officers are racially biased and stop uh, minority groups more often, we have a causal relationship of minority status on this stopping decision. Then minority status also has a causal effect on the use of force, for example, right? So that's what we want to estimate. Do uh, blacks and Latinos in the US um, experience more uh, forceful behavior by the police? But the problem is that our data is not representative, it's a selected sample. Uh, and what does that mean, a selected sample? We only observe individuals uh, if they've been stopped by the police, so if this stop variable is equal to one. So that changes suddenly our identification task again, because our query of interest is again the same. But now we need to translate it into an expression that doesn't only contain normal um, conditional probabilities like we did before, we also need to condition on this s equal to one um, indicator, because only those uh, individuals that have been stopped by the police we can observe in our administrative data. And that makes the problem actually much more complicated. Um, so selection bias is a, is a huge problem in practice that we often ignore. Uh, I mean, there are people like, uh, like James Heckman and so on uh, offered solutions for that also in the econometrics literature. But uh, in, in practice, we often ignore uh, sample selection problems. But you can solve this task with the help of due calculus. So uh, you can use the use of due calculus to translate this expression here into something that contains an uh, indicator s equal to one. Um, and I have an example over here, uh, which I again will not get into detail here. So this is a certain graph down here. I use the uh, rules of due calculus in order to translate the, sorry, the query of interest py do x into something that first of all doesn't contain a do operator because we cannot intervene on variables and that has uh, this s equal to one condition in here. So only probabilities that are observable in the selected, in the selection bias data. Okay, I see again, uh, um, questions popping up. Okay, there's something about the exam. So uh, Marina is saying, so it, is it correct to conclude that if we are interested in some policy effect, we should always think about the causal structure in order to avoid overestimating the effects of the policy? Yes, that is true, right? You can't, the, if there's one key message of this lecture is you can't do causal inference without thinking uh, about the causal structure behind your data. You can't do it fully uh, data driven. You need to make causal assumptions, otherwise you will run into a problem. Okay, yes, we will upload the video. That's right. Okay, so um, again, we use the due calculus in order to solve the selection bias, and now I'm rushing a bit ahead. Bettina will make uh, one hour longer. I will take 15 minutes more, okay, but then uh, I'll, I'll release you. Uh, but I still want to get at the, the connection to the AI part. Um, so let me get into the, the last application of the due calculus is the transportability case. Um, transportability is another word in, uh, for what we would call external validity. Uh, and it's the question about what happens if I find a causal effect estimate in one domain, can I use this also in a different but related domain, right? And that happens all the time in empirical research, because think about, um, for example, experimental research is often done in a laboratory, uh, a laboratory of students or a laboratory um, of people, uh, right, a psychological experiment. This group of students might be very different in their underlying characteristics compared to the general overall population, 
right? So maybe I run an economic experiment on uh, economic students at KO Leuven, but I actually want to say something about, you know, um, random people uh, in the overall population, right? Uh, in society, can we make this link? Is causal knowledge obtained for the students at KO Leuven actually valid um, also in a broader sense? So is it externally valid? And again, uh, Esther Duflo and, uh, and Banerjee, uh, two economics Nobel Prize winners, um, they have worked on this in the development field uh, and they have a very interesting paper uh, sort of presenting a cautionary tale uh, on this. What can go wrong if you don't think carefully about external validity? What they did, they were interested in a um, remedial education program so um, they went to uh, Indian schools, so uh, fourth graders in India, in two different cities, uh, in Mumbai and Vadodara, and they gave them basically extra tutoring. So extracurricular tutoring after school um, in, in math and reading, uh, right? So in, in, in languages and, and in math. And then later on, they checked what this had as an effect for, um, on grades. And uh, what they found, so here you have a very special setup. You do uh, a randomized control trial in actually two different domains, Mumbai and Vadodara. You would think that, you know, two Indian cities, large Indian cities, reasonably similar. So we would expect the results to be similar. But what they found was actually that um, the, the effects of the program were similar for math skills there was no positive impact on language proficiency in, um, in Mumbai. So the effect of language proficiency was much smaller in Mumbai compared to Vadodara, but in math, it was the same. Um, they had an explanation for that ex post. Uh, they they um, connected it to um, basically parents' income, and their argument was that uh, students in Mumbai uh, come from wealthier families, and that's why they already start out to be better with higher language proficiency skills, and that's why the treatment effect is not as strong uh, compared to Vadodara. Uh, but the important point is that this was all exposed, right? So they ran the two experiments, didn't find um, uh, that the results coincided, and then ex post had a theory for this. If they would have only done the experiment in Mumbai, for example, they might have concluded that, okay, the program works for math, but not for language skills, right? While if they would have done it for whatever reason in Vadodara, they would have concluded that it works in both cases, right? So that's a problem. Um, in the causal graph setting, you can actually deal with this kind of transportability case uh, by including um, extra knowledge in the graph here, uh, this so-called S node down here. Again, we uh, have an S node like before here was with the double uh, border and here it's now the square node. This S node now in this graph indicates that um, differences across domains. So if that is my causal diagram down here, I say, okay, the education program has an effect on Y and there are socioeconomic factors confounding this relationship Z, like parents' income. And I assume that this, um, the socioeconomic factors differ across domains. So I include this S note here pointing into Z, and that um, captures the notion that Z, the underlying um, characteristics between Mumbai and Vadodara are different. Because, for example, in Mumbai, kids have um, wealthier, wealthier parents. Okay, that is how I can, uh, or what I can capture with this S node here. And then the transportability task would be again to use the rules of due calculus uh, in order to translate a causal effect of interest in one domain, let's say the causal effect of the program in Mumbai, into an expression that only uses probability from another domain. So uh, if I succeed with this task, I can actually estimate the effect of uh, the causal effect in Mumbai with data I obtained from Vodoro or the other way around. My example earlier with the KO Leuven students, the transportability task would be, I want to get at the causal effect in the overall population. 
and I need to translate it into objects that I can observe only in the population of K.O. Leuven students with the help of the do calculus based on these transportability nodes. Um, and that is something I can uh, solve with do calculus and they exist um, um, automated solutions for this. The, the interesting case here is that that doesn't only work with two domains, right? Like Mumbai and Vadodara or K.O. Leuven and the overall population. You can also combine data from, from several different related sources, right? Let's say you have, um, you can run experiments in three or four different Indian cities. And then you, uh, based on that information, you want to get at the causal effect in a fifth Indian city. That is all possible. That would be called then meta transportability, but that's a topic on its own. Um, but here you already see where the data fusion part comes in. So you combine different data sources, right, um, from, from different uh, Indian cities, for example, uh, and combine them in a smart way in order to get at a causal effect of interest. Okay, final part. Um, after we've gone through all the pain of looking at these different examples, the confounding bias, the Z identification, the selection bias, transportability question, do I need to do this all by myself with the help of the do calculus? Do I need to study, you know, uh, three years, uh, all the variants, possible variants of the do calculus in order to be able to do these cool things? Uh, and the question is no, you actually don't need to bother in the end. Um, I think you should have uh, a good understanding what's happening under the hood, right? That's why I showed you uh, this example of uh, applying rule two of the do calculus, what it, uh, how it works, the underlying intuition. But if you have that, you can solve all these problems with the help of the computer. Uh, because all these tasks I've showed you before once, right? Translating the expressions into other expressions can be automatized. Uh, automatized with the help of algorithms, and uh, these algorithms work uh, in, in such a way that they take three inputs, right? First of all, you need a causal query Q, the effect of interest. Then you need to supply a model, a causal model um, that you've established. You tell the computer, okay, this is how I think the world works. And you need to tell the computer what type of data do you have available? Do I have only observational data? Do I have uh, maybe surrogate experiments that I can run the, um, the encouragement designs or uh, instrumental variable case? Do I have selected bias data, um, selection bias data, or do I have um, data from different domains, different Indian cities? Um, and that's what I tell the computer. And then, if I've supplied that, the algorithms work fully automatically and they give me an estimable expression of Q if such an expression exists. And you've already seen the schematic uh, representation of this data fusion process. Right? This here on the left, that is our task as a researcher. Right? First of all, I need to ask a good research question. I need to have a causal model that I need to supply to the computer. And I need to specify the available data. Is it purely observational? Do I have do Z available, so uh, surrogate experiments, selection bias, or from different populations? Okay. And then our task is done because this causal inference engine can be fully automatized. I don't need to care about this anymore. Okay? And uh, the causal inference engine, these algorithms are based on do calculus. And uh, if you remember early on, I told you do calculus is complete, uh, meaning that whenever there's a solution, do calculus will give me a solution. So that means the same applies for the algorithms as well. So whenever, the, whenever there's a solution, this algorithm will give me one. And if there's no solution, I can be sure that no other solution exists, right? And that's actually pretty cool. Uh, these algorithms uh, tell me fully what's going on. Whenever there's a solution, I will get an estimable expression of my uh, causal query of interest. If not, then I need to know, uh, then I know that, uh, you know, under the current set of assumptions, 
um, there's no solution to be found and maybe I need to strengthen the assumptions, introduce some functional form assumptions or whatever, right? But uh, I can be, due to completeness, I can be fully sure that there's no uh, other way of obtaining a solution. That's pretty useful for us, right? Because now we can fully concentrate on the actual process of research. I asking a good research question, coming up with a model, measuring and specifying the available data. The rest is taken care of for us. So I don't need to, you know, uh, care about the econometrics anymore. I can fully um, focus on the applied nature of it. That's why the course is called Applied Econometrics. Um, but the same is also very important for, for the AI part of the story. And that's where the connection comes full circle. Right? Because if we apply uh, or if we use these tools I presented to you, this causal inference engine, we can now actually teach a robot how to think causally. Right? And based on, we can first of all tell them uh, and teach the robot this is how the world works. If you touch a hot stove, your systems might burn or your circuits might burn. Um, and based on that model, the robot will be able. Uh, to first of all automatically observe the world, right? Go out and via its sensors uh, observe the environment and collect observational data or run experiments itself and so on. Uh, and then, based on this causal inference engine, fully automatically it can actually learn causal knowledge. That is the, the causal inference task in the AI field. How, based on these DAGs, we can teach. Um, teach artificial intelligences to think causally. Um, so this is the conclusion, right? Um, what I want to, wanted to show you in this lecture, it's really this connection between the computer science literature that I've presented to you, how it connects to tools that we have in econometrics. And first of all, um, I think that's very interesting to understand where the AI field is heading, right? Where uh, will we have in the future robots that are able to think causally and interact with us in a meaningful way because they actually understand the asymmetric notion of cause and effect? And uh, the answer is at least the computational tools are there, right? So maybe the, the fully causally thinking robot is still science fiction, but the mathematical tools are there. And maybe if our computational power becomes better in the future. Uh, this is not so far, uh, so distant in the future that uh, we actually will have robots thinking causally. But the flip side for this is that these uh, automated identification algorithms can also be very helpful for us uh, because we can now think uh, and focus purely on the applied side of the nature and the causal inference part is uh, taken care off for us, uh, and you've seen how powerful this causal inference uh, in, uh, inference engine actually is. Do calculus just three rules, but it uh, helped us to tackle all sorts of problems that we encounter in applied nature, selection bias, confounding bias, and so on. Um, and uh, so the, the DAX and the do calculus based on this present this unifying framework uh, for causal inference that we don't have with, with other approaches, right? We maybe have solutions for selection bias, the Heckman selection model, or we have the IV estimator, but these are all sorts of different disparate estimators. Um, the, the DAX and the do calculus based on it unify all these problems and you have one set of tools being able to, to address all these problems. And yeah, the last thing, possibilities to fully automate, uh, automatize the identification test. This is something that is unique to the causal AI literature that uh, we haven't encountered so far in econometrics. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. Um, if you want to look up the more technical things that I've presented you today, and it was some, I was a bit quick, uh, you can check out our paper. Um, we will also upload this um, on, uh, on the portal that you're using. I actually have a couple of teaching uh, materials uh, on my personal website. So you can check out my personal website uh, slash teaching where you can find uh, a longer version of this uh, because we already talked about, I don't know, what is it? Uh, three hour, 20 minutes. 
Um, but uh, yeah, some things were still pretty sure. So if you're interested in this, uh, you can dive deeper into. And uh, that was it. <laughs>